hey guys can you see and hear me if you can see and hear me you can uh, give a thumbs up yeah <clears throat> thank you so much so i hope you are all enjoying the academic feast in cerebellum and uh, this is my turn right now i'm going to discuss on some of the important pyqs and i've collected pyqs of the last three to four years and i know some areas are very very important and uh, those topics are the ones that are going to be repeatedly asked in exams and that is what i've compiled uh, in this pdf and that's what i'm going to show you as well and welcome everyone good evening because i don't have that much of time let me straight away move on to the session so here is your first question and you have a hypertensive patient who's clearly mentioned as non-compliant with the medication presents to you with sudden onset breathlessness and a bp of 185 upon 110 millimeters of mercury a chest x-ray was done which is shown below you can have a look at this chest x-ray so look at what's happening over here i think everyone can see the chest x-ray so can anyone comment on what's happening with the chest x-ray can anyone comment on it what's going on in the chest x-ray by the way yeah so the patient is actually having pulmonary edema okay so that's what is happening over here and what will be the right answer for this patient because they are asking how will you manage this patient in the first place so how are we going to manage by the way so you have four options right so one is iv and tg and second is nebulization uh, nebulized salbutamol third is o2 and antibiotics and fourth is observation and supportive care of course the answer is going to be iv and tg for this question because the patient is hypertensive and the patient is having a pulmonary edema so because this chest is actually showing pulmonary edema right so the drug of choice for hypertensive emergency presenting as acute pulmonary edema is going to be iv nitroglycerin or alternatively another choice will be iv nitroprusside also even iv nitroprusside can be used but in india we don't uh, use iv nitroprusside that often so nebulized salbutamol is wrong so why it is wrong because it is often used in the setting of acute exacerbation of bronchial asthma or acute exacerbation of copd and oxygen and antibiotics will be used usually if you are suspecting a pneumonia but it is not the case here and observation supportive care is just a dummy choice and this is something that we are not going to use the right answer for this question is going to be IV nitroglycerin and look at this table this is a very very important table for your exams so I just wanted to tell you uh, what are the general principles of managing a hypertensive emergency you know whenever the BP is uh, more than if the systolic BP is more than 180 millimeters of mercury or if the diastolic BP is more than 120 millimeters of mercury you often refer this as something called as hypertensive crisis you often call this as something called as hypertensive crisis and the next step uh, in hypertensive crisis is to look at the target organ damage so look at the target organ damage if it is there if the target organ damage is present it's often referred to as hypertensive emergency and if you don't have any target organ damage this is often referred to as something called as hypertensive urgency so technically in our patient we had pulmonary edema and that is why we are going to categorize them as hypertensive emergency and i have given some of the important drugs that are used in the setting of hypertensive emergency so for example in most cases look at the patient in most cases the most common drug that you're going to use is labetalol labetalol so look at most situations in most situations the most common drug in india that we use is labetalol remember even though nicardipine is mentioned in the textbooks you will have a mention of something called as clavidipin it is not available in india no company actually uh, manufactures nicardipin and clavidipin right now in india and again uh, if you look at the aortic dissection part acute aortic emergencies also usually you will use labetalol only even though textbooks mention esmolol as the first line drug remember there is no company that manufactures esmolol right now in india so that is the reason why even for acute aortic emergencies if you are in india i would still say labetalol is the first choice drug because esmolol is not available but nevertheless textbook wise IVSmol is going to be the first line drug in case if you are dealing with acute aortic dissection. 
And let me tell you some of the important points with regards to how to manage a hypertensive emergency. First, you need to know what are the general principles for managing hypertensive emergency or any hypertensive urgency for that matters. But these uh, principles of management is going to be applicable more for hypertensive emergency than hypertensive urgency. So first, what are you going to do? So in most cases, you have to reduce the BP by at least 25 percentage in the first one hour itself. And then over the next two to six hours, you have to bring the BP to somewhere around 160 upon 100 millimeters of mercury. And then you have to normalize the blood pressure over one to two days. If you ask me whether this is applicable for almost all the patients or not, answer is no. So the right BP targets will depend on what is the exact hypertensive emergency that you're dealing with. But in exam, if they just give you some hypertensive emergency, but they are not mentioned the exact hypertensive emergency, and if they ask you how to reduce the BP, this will be good to go. Like you have to reduce the BP by at least 25% in the first one hour. So that will be the usual question in your exam. Okay. So in case if you're dealing with a malignant hypertension, so malignant hypertension means whenever you have a papillary edema on top of hypertensive crisis, you're going to call it as a malignant hypertension. Again, as I told you, the first choice drug is going to be Labetlol. In case of hypertensive encephalopathy, so the first choice drug is going to be Labetlol as well. And if you're dealing with an ischemic stroke or a hemorrhagic stroke, once again, your first choice drug is going to be IV Labetlol. But remember, even though second choice drug uh, is nitroprusside in this situation, NTP stands for nitroprusside, one has to avoid nitroprusside in patients with raised ICP because nitroprusside is a arteriolar vasodilator. Remember, nitroglycerin is a venodilator, whereas nitroprusside is a arteriolar dilator. So because of arteriolar vasodilatation, it can increase the blood flow to the brain. So because of increase in the cerebral blood flow, your ICP can increase further. That's the reason why one has to definitely avoid nitroprusside in the setting of any raised ICP conditions. So I can also say that in the setting of hemorrhagic stroke, I'm not going to use nitroprusside. That's a very, very important point. Remember, in hemorrhagic stroke, no nitroprusside. I'll repeat the point again. In hemorrhagic stroke, no nitroprusside. Don't use even though it's mentioned as second choice drug in your textbooks. In acute coronary syndrome, of course, nitroglycerin will be the first choice drug, but in selected situations, you can add labetlol also because beta blockers in the setting of MI can reduce the infarct expansion, overall infarct size can be reduced by reducing oxygen consumption of the myocardium. At the same time, it can also uh, reduce the risk of ventricular arrhythmia. That's why labetlol can be used as an add-on in some selected situations. But overall, remember, nitroglycerin is going to be the first choice drug in the setting of acute coronary syndrome. In the textbooks, urapidil is often mentioned as a second choice drug, but it is not available in India. Remember, urapidil, phenoldopam, nicardipine, clavidipine, esmolol, these are the drugs that are not available in India right now. And what about acute pulmonary edema? So remember, you can use either nitroprusside or nitroglycerin. So that's the reason I already said that here if they have given nitroprusside, even that will be the right answer. It's not just nitroglycerin is going to the right answer. Even if they have given nitroprusside, even that will be a right answer for this question. So that's an alternative. And of course, you all know, many of you would have dealt with the hypertensive pulmonary edema in your hospitals very, very commonly and which means you would have given last six for sure so loop diuretics are also indicated in this situation because the patient is in pulmonary edema but very importantly please understand that i am not going to use labetlol so labetlol is something that should be avoided in the setting of acute pulmonary edema you all know why isn't it so why you should you avoid labetlol in the setting of acute pulmonary edema that is because labetlol is a beta blocker in fact it's a non-selective beta blocker so you have to be careful in the setting of copd and asthma also and because it's a beta blocker and being a negative inotropic drug, I'm not going to use in the setting of acute pulmonary edema or any heart failure situation or acute heart failure situation. Please avoid labetlol here. Okay, that's why I have not mentioned labetlol in this situation. In acute aortic emergency like aortic dissection, I told you clearly, esmolol is the first choice according to the textbooks, but still in India, I would prefer labetlol. And of course, I can add an additional vasodilator like nitroprusside, which is going to reduce the aortic wall tension. In pregnancy related emergencies like severe preeclampsia and eclampsia, once again, I'm going to use labetlol as the first choice drug. An alternative will be nicardipine, not available in India. And of course, if the patient is having seizures or otherwise called as eclampsia, I can add magnesium sulfate. Remember, nifedipine is available only in oral formulation. If you don't have labetlol, then probably you can prefer nifedipine, but it's available only in oral formulation. 
Hydralazine is available both oral as well as IV. Again, if you don't have labetalol or if the BP is not controlled with labetalol, then probably you can add hydralazine or nifedipine. And what about AKI? In AKI situation, according to WHO guidelines, phenyldopam is mentioned as a very important drug, but it's not available in India. So still, I would prefer either nicardipine or labetalol as far as the Indian subcontinent is concerned. Okay. So this is a very, very important table. So the key takeaway points are going to be two. Okay. The first takeaway point is labetalol is going to be very commonly used in most hypertensive emergencies. Second, labetalol should not be used in the setting of acute heart failure or acute pulmonary edema due to hypertensive emergency. So that's it. So these are the two points I want you to know and the general principles which is something that I have already told you. Now going to the next question. So you have a 25 year old patient who is undergoing tooth extraction for dental caries. Which of the following does not require prophylaxis against infective endocarditis? So you have four options. Prior history of endocarditis, atrial septal defect, unrepaired cyanotic heart disease and prosthetic heart valves. So what is your right answer? So can anyone tell what is the right answer for this question. So they are asking which condition does not require prophylaxis against infective endocarditis. So basically the right answer for this question is atrial septal defect. Remember even if you don't know this uh, indications for prophylaxis uh, during procedures still easily you can answer this question because ASD is a condition with very little difference in pressures between across the shunt isn't it so the gradient across the shunt is very very low in the setting of asd and that is the reason why the risk of myocardial damage in that area is going to be very very less and asd is one condition that's going to have a very very low risk of developing infected endocarditis overall so if they ask you the congenital heart disease with one of the lowest risk of infected endocarditis i would say it is going to be atrial septal defect only if they ask you a valvular heart disease with lowest risk of infective endocarditis that's going to be either mitral stenosis or you can also say MVP without MR. Remember MVP with MR increase the risk of infective endocarditis but MVP mitral valve prolapse without MR doesn't have risk of infective endocarditis and even mitral stenosis carries a very very low risk of infective endocarditis. So congenital heart disease lowest risk of infective endocarditis ASD. Valvular heart disease lowest risk of infective endocarditis is going to be your MS or alternatively MVP without MR. So we, even without knowing the indications for prophylaxis, you can easily answer this question. It's not a big deal at all. So now we are going to look at this very important table. So where I mentioned what are the important clinical indications for prophylaxis. Then I have mentioned on the important procedures that require prophylaxis. And third, I have also mentioned on what are the antibiotics that are going to use for prophylaxis. Remember, there are only six indications. I would say only six indications are there for uh, prophylaxis I mean uh, as an indication for prophylaxis in the setting of infected endocarditis so one prior infected endocarditis the patient has already had an uh, episode of infected endocarditis in the past that becomes an important indication if the patient is having a prosthetic valve or some prosthetic material that is used in valve repair so in this situation also you have to give prophylaxis and third if the patient is having uh, unrepaired Sinotic congenital heart disease. Remember, unrepaired sinotic congenital heart disease. Number four. So, if the patient is having a repaired congenital heart disease, it could be sinotic or asinotic, doesn't matter. If the patient is having repaired congenital heart disease, but there is some residual defect, which means there is a leak going on in the site of repair. The repair is not uh, adequate. So, in that situation, you have to give prophylaxis. And number five, in a patient whose uh, defect is completely repaired, so it's a sinotic or asinotic congenital heart disease, doesn't matter and the defect is completely repaired but they have placed a prosthetic material like a button or a mesh in that area to repair it and for the first six months you have to give prophylaxis remember repaired there is a prosthetic material for the first six months you have to give prophylaxis after that it's not required and finally cardiac transplant transplantation with valvulopathy which means transplanted patients who are having evidence of valvulopathy in echocardiogram or some other imaging modality so these are the six only indications very very important these are directly from the ACCHA 2013 guidelines very very commonly asked in exams even given in Harrison also so I'll repeat again prior history of infected endocarditis patient who are having prosthetic valves or some prosthetic material any unrepaired cyanotic congenital heart disease or repaired congenital heart disease cyanotic or asynotic doesn't matter with some residual leak or ongoing leak and completely repaired congenital heart disease but there was some prosthetic material in that case for the first six months you had to give prophylaxis and finally cardiac transplant with valvulopathy uh, and uh, many students will have other questions also that's why i clearly mentioned that 
these conditions don't require prophylaxis vsd asd pda with left right shunt does not require prophylaxis remember these conditions if they become right to left shunts which means once they get a eisenmenger transformation they need prophylaxis because in that condition in that situation they become a unrepaired synotic congenital artery that's why once they become eisenmenger definitely you need prophylaxis but otherwise you don't need prophylaxis and what are the procedures that require prophylaxis only two procedures that you need to know one is dental procedures including root canal treatment tooth extraction and so on second is respiratory procedures respiratory procedures not all respiratory procedures those procedures requiring incision and biopsy the best example for that will be bronchoscopic biopsy remember bronchoscopic biopsy so if you are doing only bronchoscopy but without biopsy it basically does not require prophylaxis and in the old guidelines endoscopy uh, and uh, ureteroscopy, cystoscopy and all required prophylaxis but in the current guidelines these and all has been removed as an indication of prophylaxis. You are not going to give prophylaxis in gastrointestinal genital urinary procedures. So only two dental procedures and second is respiratory procedures that require incision and biopsy like bronchoscopic biopsy. That's the best example. And what are the drugs that are going to use for prophylaxis? So in, in, in case if the patient is not allergic to penicillin, then you, have to, you are going to use beta lactams, especially the amino penicillins. So amoxicillin or ampicillin, any one you can use. So remember, if it's amoxicillin, you can give orally itself. If it's ampicillin, you can use I, IV ampicillin. Or alternative to ampicillin will be cefazolin, but in exam they won't ask you. Either amoxicillin or ampicillin, depending on which route you are preferring. And then if the patient is penicillin allergic, then your options will be either clindamycin or alternately you can give azithromycin but in exam remember clindamycin as a very important drug so give amoxicillin or ampicillin if the pain is not allergic if the pain is penicillin allergic then you are going to choose clindamycin which is available both oral as well as iv and when you are going to give the drug that is also very important remember you are going to give only single dose this is a very very famous question in many exams in the past you are going to give just a single shot of antibiotic and you have to give 30 to 60 minutes prior to the procedure. So in case if the patient is uh, in NPO status or if the procedure requires some sedation or uh, IV, IV sedation or IV anesthesia, then in that situation patient will be in NPO. So you can use an IV drug. Otherwise you can use oral drug itself. That's not a problem. But only single dose 30 to 60 minutes prior to the procedure. Nothing more than that. Okay, so Meet Patel is asking left to right do not require but right left shunt require prophylaxis. Already I told you Meet Patel that remember left to right shunt is a asynotic condition. Once these left to right shunts become right to left shunts, they get an Eisenmenger transformation. Once they become an Eisen, once they get an Eisenmenger transformation, it is going to become a unrepaired synotic congenital heart disease which comes under the indications for prophylaxis. I think you can get it. Okay, let me move on to the third question. So you have a patient who is presenting to you with an irregularly irregular pulse and having a pulse rate of approximately 120 beats per minute and a pulse deficit of approximately 20. Remember whenever the pulse deficit is more than 10, usually it indicates atrial fibrillation and of course it's a straightforward giveaway. A patient is having an irregularly irregular pulse so that itself tells you it's atrial fibrillation but also remember that when the patient is having a pulse deficit of more than 10, that also is a straight giveaway for diagnose of atrial fibrillation in your exam. So what will be the JVP finding? So of course, uh, many of you have told the right answer. Remember, absent uh, P wave, there is no P wave in the JVP basically, even though it's a correct answer as far as your uh, ECG diagnosis is concerned, but it's not a JVP finding, so I'm going to rule out. Karen A wave will not be seen in atrial fibrillation. And raised JVP with normal waveform is also something that's not going to be seen in case of atrial fibrillation. The right answer for this question is going to be absent A wave. Remember, JVP is again a very, very important topic for your exams. We all know that. In the last 3-4 years, if you ask me, like uh, one important area from clinical cardiology that they are regularly asking is the jugular venous pressure. And this is a very, very important table that I have made for you guys to understand what are the important uh, JVP findings that you need to know for exams. First, so let us look at the problems of the A wave. So A wave as per the hemodynamics it is due to atrial contraction it's a mechanical event and what are the abnormalities you know that in atrial fibrillation a wave is going to be absent and large a wave may be seen in the setting of right ventricular 
inflow obstruction or right ventricular outflow obstruction. So what is the example of right ventricular inflow obstruction? Best example is tricuspid stenosis or if you are extrapolating a little bit and if you have a good lateral thinking you can also tell right atrial myxoma which is also uh, going to cause a right ventricular inflow obstruction. Right ventricular outflow tract obstruction means it could be anything. It could be pulmonic stenosis or it could be pulmonary hypertension. So anything can cause a large area. So, but in exam, you need to know only two things. One is tricuspid stenosis. The second is pulmonary hypertension. Correct. And where you are going to see cannon airways? Cannon airways will be seen usually in the setting of either AV dissociation where you will see irregular cannon airways. And you are going to see in AV and RT where you are going to see regular cannon airways, not irregular cannon airways. In exam, they mentioned irregular cannon airways. It almost always indicates a AV dissociation. And whenever they talk about AV dissociation exam, you have to think only two conditions. One is going to be your uh, ventricular tachycardia. Okay. If they talk about tachycardia, it will be a VTAC. And if they talk about a bradycardia, it's going to be a complete heart block. There are plenty of conditions in medicine that can cause AV dissociation, but only two things that you need to know is VT and complete heart block. Brady with AV dissociation, complete heart block. Tachy with AV dissociation, ventricular tachycardia. You're going to see irregular cannon airways in these conditions. That's it. That's a very, very important point. And C wave doesn't have that much of significance basically. It is due to isovolumetric ventricular contraction phase. And uh, you can see a merging of C V wave. Okay, C wave and V wave will be merged together in the setting of severe tricuspid regurgitation. That's it. And what about X descent? X descent occurs during rapid ventricular ejection phase where the ventricle will shorten. And this shortening of the ventricle will pull the atrial floor downward. And that is the main reason for the X descent and this will create a negative pressure that sucks more blood into the atrium as well which means it's important for atrial filling also but to some extent atrial relaxation also plays a role. So what are the areas we are going to see um, problems of X descent like where you see prominent X descent. Prominent X descent will be seen in two conditions. One is constrictive pericarditis and second is tamponade. In both these conditions you can see a prominent X descent and where you are going to see attenuated X descent. The most important condition is going to be tricuspid regurgitation. But you can see in patients with right heart failure also you can see in atrial fibrillation also and sometimes rarely in congenital absence of pericardium. But I would say that prominent X descent in constitutive pericarditis and tamponade and attenuated X descent in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation are going to be very very important. Because in tricuspid regurgitation, see let me draw the normal JVP first. So this is going to be a normal JVP waveform, you have the A wave, C wave, X descent, V wave and the Y descent. But in patients with tricuspid regurgitation, you will have a merging of the C wave with the V wave. There won't be X descent at all. X descent will be completely attenuated in the setting of C wave tricuspid regurgitation and there will be merging of the C wave with the V wave and this is often referred to as something called as the C V wave. And this results in one of the important clinical signs also that is called as Lancisi's sign. So what is Lancisi's sign? Lancisi's sign means this CV wave with every bead the blood will regurgitate into the right atrium that will produce that CV wave that can cause ear lobe pulsations. So those ear lobe pulsations are the ones uh, we clinically call it as something called as Lancisi's sign. So that's why X descent will be attenuated in the setting of tricuspid regurgitation whereas it will be prominent in the setting of constrictive pericarditis and cardiac tamponade. And what are the problems of the V wave? Okay, number one, you need to know the hemodynamics. V wave is basically due to uh, venous filling of the right atrium. And if the right atrium gets filled excessively, you can get a large V wave. So, what are the situations where right atrium will get filled excessively? So, one is tricuspid regression. I told you already, it's not only about the loss of X descent in TR, it's also large V wave because of regurgitated blood that is coming back into the right atrium that fills the right atrium excessively. So in right heart failure, the ventricle will not be receiving adequate blood from the right atrium. That's why the right atrial blood will be more. So large V wave will be there. And of course, in constrictive pericarditis and sometimes in ASD. ASD, if the shunt is big, then there will be more blood coming from left atrium into the right atrium. So the V wave will be large enough. And in hyperdynamic states, the overall circulation in the body will be more so that you will have a large V wave as simple as that. And correct. So another condition is TAPV. Somebody has commented on... Uh, Total anomalous pulmonary venous connection. Yes, correct. In TAPVC also, uh, more blood is coming into right atrium. So in that situation also, you can see a large V wave. But the most important condition for exam is going to be your tricuspid regurgitation and constrictive pericarditis. And what about wide descent? So uh, wide descent is basically due to 
rapid passive filling of the right ventricle which means as the tricuspid valve opens blood gushes into the right ventricle and that will cause a drop in pressure in the right atrium that is what is going to cause the wide descent and uh, you have to know what are the conditions that produce prominent wide descent so you have to know uh, prominent wide descent almost always means it's constricted pericardium in the exam but sometimes it can be due to tr or right heart failure and where you're going to see a blunted or attenuated wide descent in the setting of tamponade and tricuspid stenosis because if the filling of the right ventricle is defective which means there is some inflow obstruction which means tricuspid stenosis will not allow the blood to move into the right ventricle and in tamponade the fluid will compress the heart so that the right ventricle will not get adequately filled so that's why you're going to see attenuated wide descent and we all know that there is a famous mnemonic isn't it so the mnemonic is often referred to as something called as pay tags so what do you mean by pay tags so in constrictive pericarditis you are going to have a prominent wide descent and in cardiac tamponade you are going to have a prominent x descent okay remember this prominent wide descent in patients with constrictive pericarditis is what is often referred in clinical practice as something called as Friedrich sign Everyone knows what is Friedrich sign. Friedrich sign means prominent wide descent in constrictive pericarditis. Remember, in tamponade, there will be prominent X descent but blunted Y descent. But in constrictive pericarditis, there will be both prominent Y as well as X descent. But the Y descent is the one that will be very, very prominent, and that's why it's given by a special name called as Friedrich sign. So I think this is going to clear all your doubts with regards to JVP, and it's such an important table for your exams. Often you tend to get one question on JVP as far as clinical cardiology is concerned. Let us move on to the next question. So this is a question just based on the previous uh, table discussion only. A patient present with fatigue and generalized edema. Evaluation of a patient revealed the presence of mid-diastolic murmur. JVP showed prominent A waves. So remember prominent A waves, large A waves. What is the likely diagnosis? Who's going to answer this question? Is it mitral stenosis or is it tricuspid stenosis or it's mitral regurgitation or it's going to be tricuspid regurgitation? So I know many people will be tempted to answer uh, mitral stenosis, but it's actually not mitral stenosis. Remember, patient is having a mid-diastolic murmur. The differential diagnosis of mid-diastolic murmur often is going to be three conditions. One is going to be mitral stenosis. Second is tricuspid stenosis. Third is going to be caracombs murmur. Okay, third is going to be caracombs murmur. So caracombs murmur uh, tends to occur in the setting of acute rheumatic fever. Okay, caracombs murmur tend to occur in the setting of acute rheumatic fever. And fourth differential diagnosis you can give is Austin Flint murmur. In Austin Flint murmur, uh, there will be a functional mitral stenosis that is because of severe aortic regurgitation. Because of severe aortic regurgitation, uh, one of the mitral valve leaflets will not open properly because the jet of the air will impinge on the anterior mitral leaflet and that will prevent the opening of the anterior mitral leaflet properly. That will produce a functional mitral stenosis that can also produce a mid diastolic murmur. So that's what we refer to as Austin Flint murmur. But you know that TS is also very, very important differential diagnosis. Remember, uh, do you think MS will produce prominent AVS in JVP or TS will produce prominent AVS in JVP? I told you already. So whenever you see large AV or prominent AV in JVP, it's going to be tricuspid stenosis. Okay, it's going to be tricuspid stenosis or probably sometimes you think about pulmonary hypertension. Okay, even though mitral stenosis with pulmonary hypertension can cause prominent AVS, but I don't think you need to think too much about it. Right answer for this question is going to be tricuspid stenosis. That's it. Nothing more than that. Yeah, correct. Uh, here MR is also wrong because MR uh, usually does not produce uh, JVP changes. Okay, JVP will be relatively normal in the setting of MR. It can be increased if the patient is having severe heart failure due to MR, but overall there won't be much of JVP problems in like MR at least in early stages. In MS also, you don't see much changes in the JVP in the initial stages unless until patient develops pulmonary hypertension where you can see a large JVP. So the right answer for this question is tricuspid stenosis. And TR, we know it's not going to produce a large A wave, rather TR is going to produce a large V wave. Okay, and you can produce a blunted X descent. We have discussed already. So the right answer for this question is option B, tricuspid stenosis. And let us move to the next question. Uh, you have 11 year old child uh, with history of streptococcal pharyngitis presents to you with fever and arthralgia. There is no past history of rheumatic heart disease or features of carditis or valvular disease is seen in this child. So how often benzathane penicillin is recommended as prophylaxis? Okay, what are you going to answer? So is it lifelong or it's going to be till 5 years or 21 years of age or is it till 10 years or 21 years of age or is it till 10 years or 40 years of age? 
So how long the prophylaxis is recommended? What is your answer? Okay, the right answer for this question is option B. Okay, till five years or 21 years of age. This is a guidance based question. So I'm not going to like uh, teach you concepts in this, but you can look at this table. So again, a very, very important table, which tells you the duration of prophylaxis. Okay, in patients with rheumatic heart disease or in patients with rheumatic fever, I should not say rheumatic heart disease, I should say in patients with rheumatic fever, this is the duration of prophylaxis. On the left side, you have ACCH recommendation. On the right side, you have WHO recommendation. But I would say you have to uh, look at the uh, ACCH recommendation only as far as exams are concerned because this is what is mentioned in Harrison. That's why. So in, patient, in patients who don't have carditis or valvulitis, the duration of prophylaxis is going to be 5 years or 21 years of age, uh, whichever is late. Our patient fits into this category only. Patient did not have carditis or valvulitis, just acute rheumatic fever, nothing more than that. If the patient is having evidence of carditis but not valvulitis, then duration of prophylaxis will be uh, 10 years or 21 years of age. Okay, I don't think carditis was there. Okay, patient is not having carditis. So they mentioned no, uh, there is no past history of rheumatic heart disease and patient is not having any history of carditis or valvular disease. So definitely it is 5 years or 21 years of age only. So the patient is having carditis, then it's going to be 10 years or 21 years of age. If the patient is having evidence of valvulitis, remember if the patient is having evidence of valvulitis, then it's going to be either for 10 years or 40 years of age, whichever is late, or if the patient is having more severe valvular damage. For example, if the patient is having heart failure because of rheumatic heart disease, or if the patient is uh, having severe valvular disease that necessitates surgery, or even after a valve surgery, once the patient undergoes a mitral valve replacement, many people think that the prophylaxis can be stopped. No, prophylaxis has to be continued. In fact, in that situation, it has to be lifelong because the rheumatic heart disease in that patient is very, very severe, causing a, a severe heart failure that is resulting in a mitral valve replacement. So it has to be lifelong prophylaxis in that situation. Okay. So whenever you see valvulitis, be very, very careful in exam. Okay. So look at where the patient is having severe uh, valvular disease or not. If the patient is having any evidence of heart failure or history of mitral valve replacement, it has to be lifelong prophylaxis. Otherwise, you can go for 10 years or 40 years of age, whichever is late. And what is the prophylaxis that you're going to give? Remember, you can use either benzathine, penicillin G, or you can uh, give some alternative drugs in case the patient is allergic. The usual dose of benzathine, penicillin is very important for exams. I don't usually mention doses for undergraduates, but some doses are very important. One example is rheumatic fever and prophylaxis. So 1.2 million units is the usual dose. If the patient is weighing more than 27 kilograms, if the patient is less than 27 kilograms, then the dose will be half of that, that is 0.6 million units. And you have to give every three to four weeks, which means in India, it's a common practice to ask the patients to come every month. Alternative to that will be oral penicillin, that is penicillin V BD. In India, uh, usually we give a drug called Pentids, 800 milligram two times a day. That's a common dose that is given by many cardiologists. But remember, it is inferior. It is inferior, okay, inferior. This oral penicillin prophylaxis is not recommended by many guidelines. It is an alternative, but it is not recommended. The best thing is give a IM benzathine penicillin every three to four weeks. And the duration will depend on what is the patient's clinical background. And what are the alternatives? Alternatives will be sulfadiazin. Okay. You can give 1 gram OD. Remember, this is the second line alternative. Many times in exam, if they ask alternative, you will answer some random things like erythromycin. Remember, for primary prophylaxis, yes, alternative is erythromycin. For treatment, yes, alternative is erythromycin. But here we are talking about secondary prophylaxis. In that situation, second line alternative is sulfadiazin. I'll repeat second line alternative is sulfadiazin and not erythromycin. Third line alternative only is azithromycin or alternative erith erythromycin. Macrolides can be used as third line only, not second line. So first line is penicillin, second line is sulfadiazin, third line is azithromycin if you are talking about secondary prophylaxis. Okay, if you are talking about primary prophylaxis or uh, primary prevention, then second line in case of penicillin allergy will be erythromycin or azithromycin. Clindamycin also can be used. But clindamycin is not approved for secondary prophylaxis. So I'll repeat for secondary prophylaxis, first line penicillin, second line sulfadiazin, third line macrolides, azithromycin or erythromycin. Now I think this is clear. Now let us move on to the next question. So again, this is a very, very important controversy. Uh, there's no controversy basically, but it's an updation in the guideline that we most of us don't know, that's all. 
So 27 year old Primi Kravda with history of prosthetic mitral valve present at 36 weeks of gestation. She was already on 4 mg of warfarin daily. Her current INR is 3. Okay. So what will be your plan with regards to anticoagulation? Remember she is 36 weeks now and she is already on warfarin and her current INR is 3. Actually it is okay. So INR 3 is fine. And she is having a prosthetic mechanical mitral valve in the background. So what will be your plans with regards to anticoagulation? What do you have to do? You have to continue warfarin and heparin or you have to discontinue warfarin and switch to heparin alone or discontinue warfarin and continue aspirin or discontinue warfarin and add heparin and continue aspirin. So what are you going to do? So what is the right answer for this question? Anyone wants to answer? Uh, I don't know why many of you are answering basically option number B. The right answer for this question is actually option D. Okay. So that's the right answer for this question. Definitely there is no doubt about that. The patient is at 36 weeks uh, about to reach labor. Okay, so definitely you have to discontinue warfarin. So there's no doubt about that. And definitely you have to give an alternative anticoagulation in the form of heparin. But remember, you can continue aspirin. Uh, nobody's, no guideline is saying to discontinue aspirin. Except the old guidelines of ACCHA that was given in 2012, which said like aspirin can be discontinued. But many guidelines after that clearly says, even Harrison clearly says that one has to continue aspirin. There is no doubt about that. Okay, so remember, first I'll finish off this part. So in pregnancy, the first important thing that you have to know is aspirin can be continued throughout. Throughout in the sense it can be continued even during labor. There is no contraindication for aspirin. So, I mean, this is a very important point. Even in any major surgery also, currently many anesthetists think that aspirin need not be discontinued. Even it can be continued on the day of surgery also, unless and until the bleeding risk of the patient is very, very high. Otherwise, we continue aspirin generally. So, even during labor, you can continue aspirin. It's not contraindicated. You can look at any guidelines if you want. You can look at ACHA guideline. You can look at EAC guideline. You can study Harrison. So, everywhere it's mentioned that you can continue aspirin throughout. No problem at all. In weeks 5 to 12, okay. In weeks 5 to 12, what are you going to do? So, a patient is having a prosthetic mitral valve and or any prosthetic mechanical valve and the patient is having uh, need for anticoagulation. So, what is the choice? In weeks 5 to 12, it depends on the dose of warfarin. Remember, in if warfarin dose is less than 5 mg, okay, in the first uh, 12 weeks, if the warfarin dose required is less than 5 mg, you can continue warfarin itself. There is no problem, okay, because the risk of teratogenicity uh, at a warfarin dose of less than 5 mg is going to be very, very less. So, you can continue warfarin. In case if the warfarin dose exceeds 5 mg, then you have to discontinue and you have to switch to heparin. So here you, you will commonly use low molecular weight heparin like enoxaparin. So only if the warfarin dose is more than 5 mg, where the teratogenic risk of warfarin will be very high in this situation. Otherwise, you can continue with warfarin itself. In weeks 12 to 36, there is it's a no-brainer. Definitely, I'm going to use warfarin only without a doubt. Beyond 36 weeks, okay, once you cross 36 weeks, now you can continue aspirin as I told you already, but you have to definitely stop warfarin and you have to switch to heparin. You have to switch to an alternative anticoagulation that is heparin. So what heparin you are going to choose here? So here the treatment of choice will be unfractioned heparin. It's not enoxaparin, it's unfractioned heparin. You have to give continuous IV infusion of unfractioned heparin till the patient reaches the point of labor or alternative will be low molecular weight heparin. Alternative will be low molecular weight heparin. So when will you stop heparin basically? So remember heparin and if you are using unfractioned heparin it can be stopped 4 to 6 hours prior to uh, expected labor. If it's low molecular heparin you have to stop 12 to 24 hours prior to anticipated labor. Okay that's the only thing because low molecular weight heparin has a higher half life so it has to be stopped 12 to 24 hours prior to anticipated labor. If it's unfractioned heparin stop it just 4 to 6 hours prior to anticipated labor. But definitely you have to stop warfarin, no doubt about that. And uh, in postpartum period, usually what you are going to do? In postpartum period, again you are going to continue aspirin, there is no contraindication for that. But remember, you can restart warfarin, but initially you will give heparin and warfarin. We all know that because warfarin needs bridging. So when you start warfarin freshly, it has to be bridged with heparin. So once you reach the target INR, so one, once you reach the target INR and after this only you are going to uh, switch to warfarin alone. warfarin alone. So what is the target INR? So target INR depends on what is the mechanical valve that you are dealing with. So if it's a mechanical aortic valve 
then the target INR will be uh, generally around 2 to 3 in patients without risk factors. In patients with risk factors, then the target INR will be 2.5 to 3.5. In patients with mechanical prosthetic mitral valve, irrespective of whether the patient is having risk factors or not, target INR will be 2.5 to 3.5. So, which means our patient who is having a current INR of 3 is actually in a correct target INR. Okay. I told you in the mitral position, the target INR is 2.5 to 3.5, irrespective of the risk factors. But if it's an aortic mechanical prosthetic valve, then the INR target will be slightly different. If it's with risk factors, then it's 2.5 to 3.5. If it's without risk factors, then it's going to be 2 to 3. So what are the risk factors? You will be also having a question, isn't it? What do you mean by risk factors? Yeah, risk factors means patients who are having atrial fibrillation, patients with history of cerebrovascular accident like stroke or TA, or if patients who are having very low ejection fraction like less than 30 percentage, or in patients who are having a known hypercoagulable state, for example, factor 5 leaden mutation or antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, something like that. So in case of risk factors, only in aortic position, you are going to set a target INR of 2.5 to 3.5. Otherwise, it's 2 to 3. In mitral position, it's always 2.5 to 3.5. Okay. That's it. So this is going to be the uh, guidelines for anticoagulation and a very, very important table again. Okay. Now, I think it's time that we move on to some questions on pulmonary medicine. Till now, we have discussed on uh, cardiology questions. Now, let us move on quickly to pulmonary medicine questions. You have a 35-year-old female patient, presently with fever, breathlessness and uh, cough with expectoration. A CT scan was done, which is shown below. What is the most likely diagnosis? I think uh, Rahul Mukherjee is asking why not warfarin beyond 36 weeks. Remember, warfarin is a dangerous drug. Remember, it's a drug with narrow therapeutic index and reversal is very difficult. Even though you give vitamin K, it's not going to reverse the effects of warfarin immediately. It's going to take time. That is why... If you are planning for some procedure, uh, any procedure for that matter, or if you are anticipating a labor, because after 36 weeks, labor can occur anytime. So that's the reason why warfarin is not an appropriate drug. Give low molecular apparent, which is much safer as a wider therapeutic index, or give unfractional apparent, which is, which is having an even wider therapeutic index. And you have a very good antidote for unfractional apparent in case of bleeding like protamine sulfate. So that's the reason why you switch to that. Nothing more than that. Okay. So now, uh, you are seeing the CT scan. So what is seeing the CT scan? It's a straightforward uh, answer. So it is going to be consultation with our bronchogram. I don't think uh, this question needs any additional explanation in the first place. You are seeing a whitish area which is nothing but basically a consultation and you can see like uh, air filled bronchus which is nothing but air bronchogram. Usually this is seen in the setting of pneumonia and there are plenty of other differential diagnosis for consultation. But in exam, at least at an EPG level exam, you are going to make a diagnosis of pneumonia whenever you see this. So it's not a mediastinal mass because mediastinal mass will be uh, somewhere here. So it's not mediastinal mass. It's not pleural effusion and it's not going to be diaphragmatic hernia as well. So there's no diaphragmatic defect. So the right answer for this question is A. Let us move to the next question. Uh, you have a patient presenting to you with fever, night sweats, ptosis and bilateral facial nerve palsy. Investigations showed leukocytosis and bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So I think uh, the other options are dummy here. It means it's wrong. So only one answer is left. That is sarcoidosis. The right answer for this question is sarcoidosis. So what is the syndrome that you're dealing with? Leave out the options here. So the options are wrong. So what is the syndrome that you're dealing with? Basically, so what is the syndrome that you're dealing with? Anyone? Any idea? What is the syndrome that you're dealing here, man? Okay. So let me tell you. So you have two syndromes basically. Okay. One is Lofgren syndrome and second is Hereford syndrome. Both are basically syndromes of acute sarcoidosis. So in exam, whenever they talk about sarcoidosis, they are going to give these two syndromes only. So one is Lofgren syndrome and second is going to be Hereford syndrome. Hereford syndrome is also called as Waldenstrom's Hereford syndrome, otherwise called as Eviopuritic fever. So what are the features of Lofgren syndrome? So fever, arthritis, erythema, nodosum and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Okay, fever, arthritis, erythema, nodosum and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. But generally in exam they will give you a triad whenever they talk about Lofgren syndrome. That is arthritis, erythema, nodosum and bilateral hilar lymphadenopathy. Bilateral hyalur lymphadenopathy. This is the typical triad of Lofgren syndrome. And remember, Lofgren syndrome is something that carries an excellent prognosis. In the sense, most of the guidelines say that you do not even give uh, steroids for this patient. You can wait because most of them will have a spontaneous resolution. So, Lofgren syndrome is something that carries a very, very good prognosis. 
And what about Hereford syndrome? Hereford syndrome is uveo parotid fever. As the name implies, patients will be having uveitis, uveo parotid, parotid enlargement, and patient will have fever. Additionally, patient will have seventh nerve palsy. And often, often, I'm not saying always, often this seventh nerve palsy will be bilateral. And typically, it will be element type. It will not be yeoman type. It will be element type bilateral seventh nerve palsy, which means bilaterally you will be able to see the Bell's phenomenon. Okay, so these are the two important syndromes with regards to sarcoidosis. Both are very, very commonly asked in exams. And the first line treatment for sarcoidosis is going to be steroids. And going to critical care questions, a patient who is on antidepressants presenting to you with hypotension, ECG was done, which showed wide QRS complexes and right axis deviation. How will you manage this patient? Remember, antidepressant, hypotension, ECG shows wide QRS complex and right axis deviation. So what is the poisoning that they are suspecting here. So what antidepressant causes wide QRS and right axis deviation. Yeah, this is tricyclic antidepressant poisoning, TCA poisoning. TCA have sodium channel blocking property and that is the reason why it causes wide QRS and often it tends to produce right axis deviation also. So, how will you manage this patient? The most important is IV soda bicarbonate. So, IV soda bicarbonate is very, very important drug in the setting of TCA toxicity plus cardiac involvement. Okay. TCA toxicity with cardiac irritation, the drug of choice is IV, bicarbonate, IV soda bicarbonate. In case if they ask you TCA toxicity causing ventricular tachyarrhythmias or TCA toxicity causing ECG changes, for all these things, the treatment of choice will be IV soda bicarbonate. You are not going to use antiarrhythmics in this situation, no propranolol, no phenytoin. So none of the other drugs will be up, uh, indicated in this situation. Okay. So this is a very important table of toxins and its respected counterparts that is antidotes. So if it's acetaminophen, if it's parastamol, we are going to use endostyl system. We all know that if it's digoxin, the best treatment will be digibind. Otherwise, uh, digoxin specific fab antibodies, everyone knows that. If it's beta blocker or calcium channel blocker, the drug of choice is going to be glucagon. If it's tricyclic antidepressant, the drug of choice is going to be soda bicarbonate. Remember, only in cardiac irritation. In case if it's local anesthetic toxicity, for example, if they give lidocaine or bubivacaine toxicity with cardiac irritation or ventricular arrhythmias, the treatment of choice is 20% IV intralipid. For OPI toxicity, the treatment of choice is naloxone. For benzodiazepines, we know the antidote is flumazenil, but it's very, very controversial. In real practice, we don't use flumazenil at all because flumazenil has a very high risk of Caesars. Generally, in practice, we don't use this at all, even though it's often mentioned in textbooks uh, that the antidote for benzodiazepine toxicity is flumazenil, but in real practice, we don't use it often. Okay, then methemoglobinemia. You are going to think about, just hold on one second, I have to just charge my laptop. Yeah, got it. So, methemoglobinemia, um, it is IV methylene blue. And in iron poisoning, it's going to be deferoxamine, IV deferoxamine again. In carbon monoxide poisoning, the antidote will be hyperbaric oxygen therapy. I think Subhashis is asking what is APAP. APAP is acetaminophen, okay, acetaminophen, that is parastomol. So carbon monoxide, it is going to be hyperbaric oxygen therapy. And uh, in ethylene glycol or methanol poisoning, it is fomipizole. In case if you don't have fomipizole, alternative will be IV ethanol. IV ethanol. Okay. In organophosphorus poisoning, you are going to use atropin and pralidoxin. In cyanide poisoning, the drug of choice will be IV hydroxocobalamin or alternative to hydroxocobalamin will be sodium nitrate or sodium thiosulfate. Sodium nitrate or sodium thiosulfate. Okay. So this is going to be alternative. Okay. For cyanide poisoning. So okay, these are the important antidote table. Okay. Very important for your exam. And this question is based on the previous MCQ only. A patient presenting to emergency department with history of uh, ingestion of 10 tablets of parastamol. Okay. So he has developed all urea and liver function tests showed deranged values. Which of the following can be used uh, in the management of this condition? Everyone should be able to answer this question pretty easily. So because it's parastamol poisoning, the right answer will be option A, that is endostyl system. And again, another question asked in the recent past in the last two three years only remember toxicology is a very very important area don't forget that okay another one a child pres presenting to emergency department with history of uh, ingestion of 10 to 20 parasulfate tablets abg reveals acidosis which of the following can be used in the management of this condition 
answer is defroxamine because they're talking about iron poisoning here. So you're going to use defroxamine. Remember, activated charcoal will not be uh, useful here because remember there are five. Uh, there are some important areas where activated charcoal is not effective. So when activated charcoal will be ineffective, there are a few conditions. Number one, um, in patients who are having late presentations. Late presentations means if the patient is presenting beyond one to two hours. After one to two hours, activated charcoal is not going to be effective because poison will already be absorbed. So there is no point. Second, in case if the patient is having some alcohol poison, for alcohols, activated charcoal is not effective. Or if the patient is uh, having some heavy metal poisoning, okay, in heavy metals also, activated charcoal will not be effective. And in patients who are having inorganic ion poisoning, inorganic ions, example for inorganic ion will be lithium, okay, lithium, lithium poisoning. There also it's not going to be effective. Example for heavy metal poisoning will be iron, lead and all. So there also activated charcoal will not be effective. And uh, in hydrocarbons, okay, in India very commonly, in India very, very commonly, uh, you see petroleum product poisoning, isn't it? kerosene poisoning, petrol poisoning, diesel poisoning. For those also, it will be ineffective. And finally for boric acid, okay, carom powder, okay, boric acid poisoning, okay, for that also, uh, activated charcoal will not be effective because we are talking about iron ingestion. So activated charcoal is going to be ineffective. But what is the decontamination technique that I can use for iron? So we are talking about iron intoxication. What is the uh, uh, like decontamination technique that you can choose? You can use something called as whole bubble irrigation. Okay, that's called WBA, whole bubble irrigation, which is done with the help of something called as polyethylene glycol. So what are the important indications for whole bowel irrigation, polyethylene glycol. It's given by pneumonia called as LIMS. L stands for lithium, I stands for iron, M stands for metals, uh, P stands for body packers. You know who are body packers, everyone would have seen it in the movies. And uh, S stands for sustained release preparations. Any drug that has sustained release preparation, you can try whole bowel irrigation. But remember, iron intoxication is an important uh, indication for whole bowel irrigation that is something that you have to surely know okay very important so here activated charcoal will be ineffective but you can actually try whole bowel irrigation dimercaprol is not approved for iron and penicillin is for other drugs i mean obviously you're going to use for wilson disease also but it is not indicated here. the treatment of choice is going to be iv defroxamine okay another critical care question a man on diuretics presents with weakness ecg was done which showed flat t waves and prominent u waves what is the most likely diagnosis so the patient is having flat t waves in ecg and prominent u waves so what is the most likely diagnosis so obviously the right answer for this question is going to be hypokalemia so whenever you see prominent u waves think of two things in exam one is extreme bradycardia and second is hypokalemia Okay, hypokalemia. So there are only two things that you need to know. Whenever you see prominent UVs, think about two conditions. One is extreme bradycardia and second is hypokalemia. So in these situations, the UVs become prominent. So the right answer for this question is hypokalemia. We all know that. And again, I have given a table for you. And again, this is a kind of a must-know table. You have to know for sure uh, regarding what are the easy changes that you're going to get in the setting of uh, different electrolyte disturbances. You know, in hypocalcemia, you're going to see prolonged ST segment and that's going to produce a prolonged QT interval, very often asked in exams. And in hypercalcemia, you're going to see a shortened ST segment that is going to in turn result in a short QT interval. Again, a very important question in exam. In hypokalemia, you're going to see ST depression and along with that, uh, you're going to see shallow, flat or inverted T waves and you're going to see a prominent U wave. Okay, very important question again. And uh, in hyperkalemia, you're going to see tall, peaked, tented, symmetric T waves. And you will see flat P waves and even absent P waves. The P waves will be completely lost. That's called atrial paralysis. And you will see wide QRS along with prolonged PR interval. And patients can have bundle branch blocks, AV blocks, and anything in hyperkalemia. In hypomagnesemia, uh, you're going to see tall T waves. Remember, that's a very important point because uh, hyperkalemia can cause tall P waves. And similarly, hypomagnesemia also can cause tall T waves and they can cause ST segment depression. Hypermagnesemia can cause prolonged PR interval and wide QRS complexes like this thing. Okay, so these are the important ESG changes that you need to know. And another important thing that you need to know is sodium. Okay, changes. Sodium changes will not produce much of ESG abnormalities. If in hyponatremia and hypernatremia, you don't see that much of ESG abnormality. Very, very important point. You don't see ESG changes in 
uh, sodium related problems that's why there is a famous saying in medicine that sodium hammers your brain potassium stabs your heart generally sodium kills you by causing changes in the intracranial pressure and changes in the brain and potassium kills you by usually causing ventricular arrhythmias cardiac problems so sodium hammers your brain potassium stabs your heart okay so this is the next question so you have a patient with coronary artery disease presenting to you with chest pain and palpitations the easy is shown below which of the following can be used in the management which of the following can be used in the management so first of all you need to know what question you are dealing with okay what is the ecg that you are dealing with you are dealing with a narrow complex tachycardia or a wide complex tachycardia what are you dealing with basically so here you are dealing, I mean it's straightforward ventricular tachycardia only but in real life we don't uh, make a diagnosis of VT or SVT just by looking at the ECG. In urgent situations, in the emergency and all, first you need to make a diagnosis of whether it's a white complex tachycardia or whether it's a narrow complex tachycardia. So basically we are dealing with a white complex tachycardia here. I mean straightforward it's a VT only but we are dealing with a white complex tachycardia. In white complex tachycardia, one of the first drugs that you are going to use is amiodrone. So here, sorry, not oral amiodrone. I think I got confounded by some of your answers. It's actually IV amiodrone. Okay, IV amiodrone is something that I have to use. Okay, I think there's an issue. Okay, IV amiodrone. That's what I'm going to use. Just hold on. Okay, I think there was some loading issues there. I'll try to rectify it by that time. Also, share and subscribe to our channel for that time being. Okay, so how we are going to approach uh, tachycardia with pulse, by the way? So, what is the way to approach a tachycardia with a pulse in the first place? Um, so remember when you are dealing with a patient who is having a tachycardia, the first thing that you have to see uh, where the patient is hemodynamically stable or unstable. So look at the hemodynamic stability. I think I will try to reopen it, just hold on. Yeah, I'll try to write again. Okay, so if you are dealing with a patient with tachycardia and a pulse, just hold on, guys. There is some issue over here. Just hold on. guys sorry back again okay there was some uh, issue in the pen i think it's not writing properly anyway now i think we are back okay so we are talking about tachycardia with pulse okay how you are going to deal with it so what you have to see is whether the patient is hemodynamically stable or not so that's what you need to see next okay hemodynamically stable or not if the patient is not hemodynamically stable, if the patient is hemodynamically unstable, then you are going to go for synchronized DC cardioversion. This is a very common question asked in exam. In case if the patient is hemodynamically stable, 
then you have to see where the patient is having narrow complex tachycardia or a wide complex tachycardia. You need to look at the QRS width. So the QRS width can be less than 0.12 seconds, which means it's a narrow complex tachycardia. If the QRS width is more than 0.12 seconds or 120 milliseconds, it's going to be a wide complex tachycardia. So in case if it's a narrow complex tachycardia, uh, what you're going to do, is of, of course you have to rule out sinus tachycardia. Once you have ruled out sinus tachycardia, the next step is to see whether the patient is having a regular rhythm or an irregular rhythm. If the patient is having a regular rhythm, so obviously I will try vagal maneuvers first. Then if it's not working, then I can use adenosine. Okay, Vagal maneuvers first. If it's not working, I can use adenosine. The usual initial starting dose of adenosine is going to be 6 mg and that's very commonly asked in exam. If it's irregular rhythm, generally vagal maneuvers will be ineffective and even adenosine is not going to be effective. Remember, in fact, if it's an irregular rhythm, Adenosine is contraindicated. Never use adenosine in irregular rhythms. You cannot use it. And uh, because in atrial fibrillation, adenosine can actually worsen atrial fibrillation. That is the reason why in irregular rhythms, generally I will say adenosine cannot be used. So in irregular rhythm, what are you going to use? You can use beta blockers. Okay. Or alternatively, you can use non dihydropyridine calcium channel blockers like verapamil or alternatively even diltiazem. So what about white complex tachycardia? In case if it's going to be a white complex tachycardia, Usually, guidelines recommend you to start with antirhythmic drug infusions. Antirhythmic drug infusions, as per the ACLS algorithm, there are three drugs that are approved uh, in antirhythmic drug uh, in antirhythmic drug infusions. One is going to be amiodarone, second is sotalol, and third one is going to be your uh, prokinamid. Okay, but we know in India, commonly we are going to use. Amiodron. Amiodron is a drug that we are going to commonly use as far as Indian subcontinent is concerned. But remember, all of these drugs, all of these drugs that mentioned in ACLS protocol can cause long QT interval. And that's why you cannot give it in TOS ID pointer. In case if you are clearly suspecting a TOS ID pointer, if it's a TDP, then clearly your choice of drug will be magnesium sulfate. Okay, Magnesium sulfate will be the choice in case if it's a TOS ID. Otherwise, you cannot give magnesium sulfate. So what we are dealing with here, we are having a patient who is stable. They are not mentioned about hemodynamic stability. So let us assume the patient is stable and patient is having um, a white complex tachycardia. Because it's a white complex tachycardia, my choice will be IV or neutral. Okay. Okay. Coming to the next question, I think we have finished the critical care discussion also. Now it's time that we move on to neurology discussions. So you have a female patient presenting to you with unilateral headache. It is associated with nausea, photophobia, and phonophobia. What is the drug of choice for acute management? Um, remember, fluna, I mean, what is the diagnosis here? It's a straightforward one. Patient is having a unilateral headache. Patient is having nausea, phonophobia, photophobia. So all these things are going to point towards the diagnosis of migraine over here. So what is the drug of choice for acute management of migraine? Of course, answer will be some sort of tryptan. That is sumatriptan. That's the right answer here. Flunarizin can be used for migraine but it's for chronic prophylaxis chronic management propranol can also be used in migraine but it's for chronic treatment topiramid also can be used but it's for chronic treatment as well okay so sumatriptan is the one that can be used for acute management right answer for this question is option b and uh, let me give you another very important table so where you can actually look at uh, drugs with level a evidence in acute migraine level a evidence in acute migraine you can use simple analgesics like astomnophen or you can use ergot compounds like dihydroergotamine or you can use NSAIDs like high dose aspirin or diclofenac or naproxen or uh, brufen. In India, we often use another drug called as ketorolac also. Even ketorolac is fine. That also can be used in India. Okay. Then opioid drugs like butorphanol. You know butorphanol is a agonist antagonist for mu receptor and a partial agonist at kappa receptor also. So butorphanol is an opioid compound. Even that has been approved. It has a level A evidence. And a lot of triptans are there. Each and every triptan is unique and special. Right now I cannot discuss because of lack of time. There are so many triptans. Okay, like Suma triptan, Almo triptan, Eli triptan, Prova triptan, Nara triptan, Risa triptan, Zolmi triptan, and so on. Any of these triptans can be used in the setting of acute attack of migraine. So triptans are basically 5-HT, 1-B, 1-D agonist. The main problem with 5-HT, 1-B, 1-D agonism is going to be vasoconstriction because these are vasoconstricting drugs they are contraindicated in patients with ischemic conditions like coronary artery disease history of mi or patients who are having seizures or uh, patients uh, who are having severe peripheral arterial disease raynaud's phenomenon in these situations and all it's better to avoid vasoconstricting drugs like triptans even for that matters 
uh, ergot compounds are also vasoconstricting drugs so it's better to be avoided in these conditions as well and combination drugs also can be used like astronaphan aspirin caffeine combination which is commonly available in india and you can use sumatriptan naproxen combination also other drugs like remigipant so what is remigipant it's a oral so whenever you use the term gipant okay gipant gipant means they are oral um, cgrp inhibitors so remember the parental cgrp inhibitors cgrp means calstone and genital peptide the parental cgrp inhibitors which are monoclonal antibodies will be used for chronic prophylaxis chronic treatment but oral drugs like gipants are indicated for acute attack of migraine and last minute on what is last minute on these are called as dittans dittans are basically 5ht 1f agonist okay they are basically 5ht 1f agonist because they don't have 1b 1d agonism they are relatively safe in patients with coronary artery disease and peripheral arterial disease and even in Raynaud's phenomenon because this is not a vasoconstricting drug that's why dittans can be used even if the patient is having coronary artery even though caution is exerted as per fda but still it is relatively safe compared to the of triptans in patients with coronary artery disease peripheral artery disease and Raynaud's phenomenon because they don't have the 1b 1d agonism they are just 5st 1f agonist so these are the most important drugs that can be used in the setting of acute attack of migraine but what about prophylaxis when you talk about prophylaxis remember only four drugs are having great evidence one is propranolol okay second is going to be topiramet second is going to be topiramet and third is going to be valproate okay and fourth is cgrp inhibitors cgrp inhibitors what are the cgrp inhibitors uh, we have the monoclonal antibodies these are basically parenteral drugs monoclonal antibodies so the best example for that is we have something called as erinumab which is approved and we have something called as framenazumab we have something called as galcanazumab eptinizumab so many drugs are there which are approved these are monoclonal antibodies and has to be given subcutaneously and these are drugs that are approved for prophylaxis these are having grade a evidence in that very commonly in india we use propranolol and topiramid and uh, other drugs like amitriptyline that is tricyclic antidepressants also can be used sonisamide can be used lamotrigine can be used gabapentin can be used but they don't have that much of evidence for prophylaxis of migraine any drug can be used but these are the drugs that are commonly preferred with highest level of evidence in india very commonly we use either propranol or topiramid in resistant cases sometimes you may prefer valproate if they ask you is there any drug that is safe in pregnancy answer is no it's a resounding no the only drug that is safe in pregnancy is astemnophen okay so that's the only drug that's safe in pregnancy none of the other drugs can be considered as pregnancy safe please understand in pregnancy only one drug that you can use that is astemnophen yes flunarizin also can be used calcium channel blockers also are grade a evidence like flunarizin is very commonly used isn't it in india there are multiple brand names for flunarizin that also is considered to be a very good drug for prophylaxis okay coming to a next uh, question so you have a 37 year old woman presenting with headache for six months she has been uh, taking analgesics regularly the headache recently increased in severity for three days but reduced on stopping the analgesics what is the likely diagnosis it's a straightforward one isn't it so there is no need of any second invitation to tell the right answer they have clearly mentioned on stopping the analgesic the headache is reduced but the headache is increasing in severity after taking the analgesic which means the right answer for this question is going to be medication overuse headache it's not tension it's not migraine it's not plus headache but remember these three are very very commonly asked in exam that's why i've given another very important table so how to differentiate between tension type headache migraine versus cluster headache first of all let us look at the prevalence of uh, different types of the primary headache disorders so tension type headache is very very common 30 to 40 percent of the cases are going to be tension type migraine is also common but not that common as tension type headache cluster headache is a relatively rare disorder it's not very common and what is the age of onset usually younger population will be affected with migraine and uh, tension type headache and cluster headache will affect the middle-aged population generally patients who are in the 30s and 40s is there any sex bias yes tension type headache as well as migraine will be common in females whereas cluster headache will be very very common in males family history is very very common in the setting of migraine but you don't see that much of family history in patients with tension type headache and uh, cluster headache what is the typical location typical location is going to be the frontal to occipital region in case of tension type headache which means the patient will have a band like headache and it will be bilateral and it will be non-throbbing non-pulsatile non-throbbing whereas in patients with migraine you're going to have more often a unilateral throbbing and a pulsating headache and will be in the frontotemporal location very very commonly 
When you talk about cluster headache, in cluster headache, the patient will have a boring pain or a tearing kind of a pain and it will be typically retroorbital, okay, in the ophthalmic distribution of the trigeminal nerve. So, which means in the retroorbital, supraorbital or rarely in the temporal region. But around the eyes is very, very common when it comes to cluster headache. What is the duration of headache? If it's a tension type headache, it's going to last for minutes or even for days because it's due to stress. Uh, typical duration of migraine will be somewhere around 4 to 72 hours, okay. It will be hours to days and uh, cluster headache will last for somewhere around 10 to um, 10 minutes to 2 hours but typical duration as far as the textbooks are concerned is 30 minutes to 180 minutes okay this is the typical duration of cluster headache but it's highly variable depending on what book you read this is the table that i have taken from cmdt that is uh, your current medical diagnosis and treatment there's a beautiful table okay in that book and onset and course um, intention type headache is going to be gradual onset it's going to be worse in PM, which means in the evening times it's going to be more and it's going to be more episodic and chronic. If it's going to be a migraine, it's going to be more gradual in onset and at the same time it's going to be worse in the evening times more than morning times. But when we talk about cluster headache, it's going to be more common in the early AM on the late PM. Typically, the midnight attacks are very, very common. In the night time, the patient will get severe attacks, midnight attacks. The patient will... Uh, be woken up from sleep and the patient will be running around with pain. So that's very typical of cluster headache. So I would say like three M's for cluster headache. One is middle-aged, second is men, third is middle of the night. So I'll repeat cluster headache, middle-aged, men, middle of the night. Three M's that you have to know. And patients will have usually daily attacks when it comes to cluster headache. And quality will be band-like consistent pain. Here you'll have throbbing pain and here you'll have a constant aching or a probably sometimes stabbing pain. Severity is mild to moderate only, which means it's a non-disabling pain. Patient can still continue to do their work. If it's a migraine, the patient will have moderate to severe pain, where the pain will not allow the patient to uh, continue doing their work. And RI is very characteristic, and patient with cluster headache will have very severe pain. It's a severe high-quality pain, and it will wake the patient from sleep often, and patient will have autonomic symptoms like congestion or rhinorrhea. And what is the palliation? What will reduce the pain? In both tension type headache as well as migraine, rest will reduce the pain. Whereas in cluster headache, the patient will be walking around. I told you patient will get up from the bed in the middle of the night and the patient will be running around or walking around with pain. That is very, very characteristic of cluster headache. So whereas patients with migraine tend to take rest. They'll go to a quiet room and they will sleep. That's going to reduce the pain in migraine. There will be no acid symptoms. Sometimes there could be some neck related tenderness and pain and all in patient with tension type headache, but there are no much specific problem. And uh, in migraine, we call migraineous features, the nausea, vomiting, photophonophobia, or our migraineous features. And autonomic symptoms like lacrimation, congestion of the eyes, redness of the eyes, ptosis, horner like picture, that all is very characteristic of cluster headache. So this is a very, very important table, very commonly asked in exam. You know, for tension type headache, acute treatment will be just simple analgesics. Migraine acute treatment you have discussed already. And for cluster headache, acute treatment is going to be 100% oxygen or even triptans can be used for acute cluster headache okay so only two treatment that you need to for acute cluster headache one is 100 percent oxygen second is going to be your uh, triptans even that is effective in patients with cluster headache and coming to the next question look at this 30 year old man presenting with excessive fatigability towards the end of the day which means there is a diurnal variation that improved with rest he also gives history of ptosis difficulty in speech and swallowing what is the most likely diagnosis so option A is myasthenia gravis, option B is LEMS, option C is Duchenne muscular dystrophy, option C is systemic lupus erythema. I don't know why they have given the option of systemic lupus erythema as well. Right answer for this is myasthenia gravis. Okay, very, 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 very important. Okay, for your exams, myasthenia gravis. So remember in myasthenia gravis, the what are the key points in exam that you need to know? One is if the examiner gives the word called fluctuating weakness. Fluctuating weakness. This is a typical point that suggests myasthenia gravis in exam. And again, myasthenia gravis the tone, the reflexes, okay, all will be normal. Okay, even though there could be minimal proximal weakness or even severe proximal weakness, but the tone and reflexes will be normal and the plantar will be down going, which means there will be no Babinski positivity. So this is a very, very important point as far as myasthenia is concerned. And patients will often tend to have ocular weakness. Ocular weakness. Ocular muscle weakness is very characteristic of myasthenia. That's why this patient is having ptosis. And in an exam, you see the word ptosis. One of the first possibilities that you have to think is myasthenia gravis. And they can produce bulbar weakness, like there could be difficulty in speech and swallowing. That are also very classic of myasthenia gravis. But ocular weakness is so special. Don't forget that. And patients can present with diplopia also, not just with ptosis. And limbs will not have ocular involvement. You will not have significant ocular involvement. And patient with limbs will often more have a girdle involvement. There will be girdle weakness and often it will be associated with 
small cell lung cancer. Duchenne muscular dystrophy, it will be common in young children, you know, by around 10 years of age itself, patient would have been in wheelchair. And SLE is an unrelated option here. And I'm going to show another very important clinical table over here. So, which is going to tell you how to differentiate between UM and LM and neuromuscular junction weakness and myopathy. So, first you need to know the distribution of weakness. Remember, what is the typical UM and distribution of weakness? The upper limb extensors and lower limb flexors. I'll repeat upper limb extensors, lower limb flexors and hip abductors. Okay, this is the area that's going to be weak in patients with UM. There will be no atrophy, no fasciculations. The tone of the muscles will be increased. The patients will have spasticity and deep tendon reflexes will be exaggerated. They will be brisk and plantar will be upgoing and this is what we are going to call it as Babinski. And what about your uh, LMN? LMN will be distal, more distal and it will be more patchy and segmental weakness. And atrophy will be very severe in LMN. Okay, it's a very characteristic feature. And fasciculations are very, very common, especially if anterior horn cell is involved. And tone will be reduced, which means the muscle will be flaccid, not spastic. Deep tendon reflexes will also be sluggish. It will be reduced or even absent. And plantar will be downgoing. There will be no Babinski. And neuromuscular junction weakness you are going to see predominantly ocular weakness and bulbar weakness and you will have proximal limb weakness. But this ocular weakness is very characteristic of myasthenia gravis. And you are not going to see any atrophy, you are not going to see fasciculations or fibrillations and most often than not, uh, you are going to have a uh, normal tone and a normal deep tendon reflexes which is something that I mentioned already and plantar will be downgoing as well. In myopathy, patients will have more of proximal symmetric weakness, that's all. There won't be significant ocular involvement in myopathies and there won't be significant bulbar involvement unless until the disease is having a very uh, severe manifestation or if it's a late stage disease. And uh, often you are going to have like uh, no or very mild atrophy, none or I can say mild atrophy and usually you know like there will be no fasciculations and the tone can be normal or in very severe disease it will be slightly reduced, not much and uh, the Reflexes also will be normal or very mildly reduced in very advanced disease and again plantar will be downgoing. There will be no Babinski. So this is a very very important table again that tells you the differences between UM and LM and neuromuscular junction and myopathic disorders. Okay, now let us move on to endocrinology. So you have a patient with diabetes mellitus for the past 5 years presenting with vomiting and abdominal pain. She is non-compliant with medication and appears dehydrated. Investigations revealed a blood sugar of 500 milligrams per deciliter and the presence of ketone bodies, what is the next best step in management. So you are going to give IV fluids or IV insulin or IV fluid with long acting insulin or IV fluid with regular insulin. Obviously, you now the right answer for this question is IV fluid with regular insulin. So remember, IV fluid is very very important for resuscitation. So you all would have known what is the diagnosis here. Diagnosis is going to be DK. Here you are talking about a diabetic ketose dosis. So definitely for resuscitation purpose, IV fluid is very, very important. Commonly we use normal saline or half normal saline depending on the corrected sodium. But it's important. The primary problem in DK is insulin deficiency. Unless and until you give insulin, DK will not be corrected. I would say like insulin is the most important treatment as far as diabetic ketose dosis is concerned. Because in DK you are admitting the patient for ketose dosis, not for diabetes. Just if the patient is having high sugars, it's just diabetes. It's not diabetic ketose dosis. You are admitting the patient for ketose dose only. If you want to correct ketose doses, insulin is the most important treatment. Otherwise, you cannot correct ketose doses at all in the first place. So this table will tell you the differences between the diabetic ketose doses and hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome. Again, a very important table. You know, DK is very common in type 1 diabetes. HHS is very common in type 2 diabetes. In DK, the blood sugars will be high but it can occur at a blood sugar of even 300. So, you know, like blood sugar doesn't matter here. I'll tell you again. It's actually the ketose doses that brings the patient to the hospital. So, blood sugar can be even 250, 300 also. It, it, it may not be like 500, 600. But in HHS, the main reason for admission to the pay, admission to the hospital will be the hyperosmolality. If high glucose should cause hyperosmolality that's causing CNS changes, it should be very, very high. So, that's why the blood glucose usually will be very high, like more than 600 or even 800,000 and all. So what differentiates DK from HHS is the acidosis. So DK patients will be acidotic, the pH will be less than 7.3, bicarbonate will be less than 18 and patients will have ketonemia. Remember the plasma ketones are more important than the urine ketones. And in HHS patients there won't be ketonemia but they can have mild ketonuria. That is why I often say my residents don't do 
urine acetone. Urine acetone is an outdated test. Always do a plasma beta hydroxybutyrate or plasma ketones. The ketonemia is the most important point. So that is the one that differentiates TK from HHS. In both the situations, there could be acetone positivity in the urine. Urine acetone is an outdated test. Don't do it. And DK is more of acute onset, whereas HHS is going to occur insidiously over a period of uh, time. And that also explains why DK presents with a lower blood sugar itself. Because it's very acute, you don't have uh, time to develop very high blood sugar. That's why they come with usually a 300-350 sugar itself. But HHS subacute, insidious, so they can go up to a sugar of like 600 or even 800 milligrams per deciliter. And DK patients usually will have severe abdominal pain, vomiting, weight loss, lethargy and even altered mental status. But patients with HHS, the most important is presenting with extreme dehydration and they will have mental obtundation. The altered mental status is the main feature of the, uh, HHS. That's the thing that brings the patient to the hospital. And they can have other problems like severe renal failure and thrombosis. Mortality is less than 5% because DK we know how to treat it. If you give sufficient amount of insulin, patient will recover. But because the patient is presenting late more often than not, mortality is going to be very very high like more than 15%. So what is the treatment? So I'll write the treatment here. Commonly, I used to teach my residents in the form of some algorithm called as FLIP algorithm or FLIP regime. So in that FL stands for fluids. Okay. I stands for insulin. And P stands for potassium. Okay. P stands for potassium. So remember, when you talk about diabetic ketose doses, if it's a DK, fluids are the first treatment. Insulin is the best treatment as far as DK is concerned. When you talk about hyperosmolar hyperglycemic syndrome, Fluids are the most important treatment. Fluids are very important. Insulin is only supplementary. It all depends. DK fluids are only for resuscitation. Insulin is the most important treatment. But in HHS, insulin is only supplementary. Fluids are the most important treatment as far as HHS is concerned. Depends on what situation you are dealing with. But remember, all of these things has to be taken care. That's again a very, very important point. And uh, what insulin to choose? Often it's a regular insulin. So you know that long acting, short acting, I'll tell you, you know, like this long acting regular insulin doesn't have any difference if you give IV. Only if you inject this insulin subcutaneously, there is a difference in the pharmacokinetics. It will become a long acting or ultra short acting or short acting. But if you're going to use this insulin IV, there is no difference at all. All insulins are going to act as insulin. That is regular insulin. That's a human insulin. So why you want to use like long acting insulin or ultra short acting insulins like analogs and increase the cost of therapy? So it's not required. That's why we often use only regular insulin. Okay. Now coming to the next question. A female patient with uh, negative urine pregnancy test presents to you with galactoria. MRI was done which reveals a large pituitary tumor. If the patient is not willing for surgery, which of the following is the best drug for treatment? So remember, whenever you talk about macroidoma, here they are talking about a large pituitary tumor. When, it, when the mention is about large pituitary tumor, they are talking about a macroadenoma, right? They are talking about a macroadenoma. So the treatment of choice for any macroadenoma is actually surgery. Okay, treatment of choice for any macroadenoma, I mean prolactinoma, prolactin secreting macroadenoma is actually surgery only. But here they have told that the patient is clearly not willing for surgery. If the patient is not willing for surgery, then, okay, the right answer for this question will be bromocryptin. Okay, you have to give a dopamine receptor agonist for treatment of prolactinoma. And promethazine is not a therapy. Octreotide is not a correct answer here, but it can be used for growth hormone releasing pituitary adenomas. It can be used for growth hormone releasing pituitary adenomas. And clozapin is something that we are not going to use here. Anyway, it's a dummy choice only. So this is another important uh, table, I would say, or you can call it as an algorithm that is uh, important for the management of hyperplactinemia. So remember, whenever the patient is having hyperplactinemia, Definitely, it's better to do MRI in almost all patients to establish the presence of pituitary adenoma. So remember, usually in the setting of pituitary adenoma, your serum prolactin levels will be generally more than 200. Even that is a very important exam question. Even uh, uh, serum prolactin level usually will be more than 200 if it's a pituitary adenoma. And you have to know whether it's a microprolactinoma or macroprolactinoma. So if it's macroprolactinoma, okay, which means if it's a macroadenoma, the treatment of choice is actually surgery only. If the patient uh, okay, uh, not willing for surgery, then you can try dopamine receptor agonist. So dopamine receptor agonist could be either bromocryptin or cabergolin. Or if the patient is having a symptomatic uh, microplacnoma, then again you can use a dopamine receptor agonist like bromocryptin or cabergolin. In case the patient is having asymptomatic microplacnoma, then you can um, 
uh, just go for regular monitoring. There is no need for any treatment. You can just observe those patients. So the, what are the indications for therapy? The setting of prolactinoma. So one is going to be symptomatic microprolactinoma. Symptomatic microprolactinoma. And second will be macroprolactinoma. Macroprolactinoma. Okay. So these are the two important indications for treatment. If it's a macroprolactinoma, usually it's better that you take the patient for surgery. But if the patient is unwilling, the first line treatment will be dopamine receptor agonist. If the patient is not responding to dopamine receptor agonist, then we are going to go for transphenodal surgery, that is TSS. Second step is surgery. If the patient does not respond to dopamine receptor agonist. Going to the next question in endocrine. So which of the following is not seen in patients with MEN2B syndrome? So MEN2B, okay, we are talking about MEN2B, multiple endocrine neoplasia 2B syndrome. So megacolon will be seen in 2A, okay, not in 2B. Mucosal neuromas will be seen in 2B and Marfanite body habitus will be seen in 2B. Parathyroid noma will also be seen in 2A. Okay, so now you have two conflicting choices. So one is parathyroid noma and second is megacolon. So there are some cases of men 2B which can cause megacolon that's been mentioned in some textbooks. But one thing for sure that you need to know which will not occur in patients with men 2B is actually parathyroid adenoma. This is a kind of controversial question. Remember, megacolon is very commonly associated with men 2A compared to that of men 2B. And that's mentioned in many textbooks. But there are some uh, textbooks like CMDT which also mentioned that uh, men 2B or patients also can have incidence of megacolon. A slight incidence is there. That's why I can write 2A, 2B also to some extent. But one thing that you will not surely see in patients with uh, men 2B is parathyroid noma. It is seen only in 2A. It is not seen in men 2B at all. So again, I wanted to tell a table. So I want to write a table. So that tells you the differences between different men's syndromes. Again, a very important topic in exams in both INACT as well as NEPG. Even in FMG, it's very important. So you know, men 1 is called as Vermer, men 2A is called as Sippel syndrome, and we have men 2B syndrome. So what is the inheritance? Inheritance pattern is autosomal dominant. So what are the mutations? In MEN1, the mutation is MEN1 gene present in chromosome 11. In um, MEN2 a and MEN2B, the mutation is going to be in the red protoncogen that is present in chromosome number 10. So what about parathyroid adenoma? So parathyroid adenoma is a feature of both MEN1 and MEN2 a but it's not a feature of MEN2B. Pituitary adenomas are usually seen in MEN1, but it's not a feature of MEN2 a and MEN2B. And pantreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms are commonly seen in MEN1 and it's not a feature of MEN2A and MEN2B. That's the reason why um, MEN1 is often referred to as triple P syndrome. What is triple P? You are going to see three P's. Parathyroid adenomas, pituitary adenomas and pantreatic neuroendocrine neoplasms. And MTC is not a feature of MEN1 and pheochromocytoma is also not a feature of MEN1. Whereas MTC and pheochromocytoma are very very common in patients with MEN2A and MEN2B. Which means whenever there is red mutation, very commonly you are going to see uh, pheochromocytoma and middle age thyroid cancer. So what are the other pointers that you need to know? So men one can also produce something called as angiofibromas. They can produce collagenomas and they can produce lipomas and they can also produce another very very important uh, problem that's called as carcinoid tumors and again there is a small important point with regards to carcinoid. Remember carcinoid tumors will usually occur in the midgut okay in sporadic cases it is very common in the midgut, but in men one syndrome, it very commonly occurs in the foregut, like gastric carcinoids, bronchial carcinoids, okay. So thymic carcinoids, these are very common in men one syndrome patients. And what about men two a? Men two a uh, can have megacolon, okay. But remember, men two b also can have slight incidence of megacolon, but men two a is very important, and uh, they can also produce something called as cutaneous amyloidosis, cutaneous lichen amyloidosis, amyloid plaques in the skin. And men 2B, men 2B tend to produce marfanoid body habitus, marfanoid body habitus, and they also tend to produce mucosal neuromas. And that mucosal neuromas are very, very important. They have 100% incidence. It means any patient men 2B will have mucosal neuromas. So that is the reason why men 2B is also often referred to as something called as triple M syndrome. Triple M syndrome. Triple M means you have MTC, marfanoid body habitus, and mucosal neuromas. Men 1 is triple P syndrome. And uh, men 2B is triple M syndrome. And if they ask you the cause of death, remember when you talk about men 2A, the pantreatic neurodegrad neoplasm, sorry, men 1, in men 1 syndrome, the pantreatic neurodegrad neoplasm is going to be the reason for death. MTC is going to be the reason for death in men 2 syndromes. Men 2A and men 2B, MTC is the reason for death. In men 1 syndrome, usual reason for death will be pantreatic neurodegrad 
neoplasm. Okay, so let us move on to nephrology now. So I have two, three questions for you. So first question, a woman presents to you with fever, arthralgia, ulcers, fatigue for the past six months and a new onset hematuria. Urine examination reveals blood cell gas and proteinuria. What is the likely diagnosis here? So it's definitely not post epitocal glomerular nephritis because there's no history of pharyngitis and acute nephritis nephritis will usually occur after an infection or after a drug intake. It is not there here. It's not IgA nephropathy because um, the picture doesn't fit into IgA nephropathy at all because IgA nephropathy should not cause uh, arthralgia, should not cause ulcer, should not cause fever. In fact, IgA nephropathy patients usually will be asymptomatic. They will just have renal involvement. I mean, in the books you will study, they will have a URA protrom, then they will develop uh, your nephritis but remember like usually at the time of nephritis they won't have much of symptoms at all so that rules out IgA nephropathy also the right answer for this question is going to be lupus nephritis straightforward that is the one thing that fits into the entire clinical picture that we are seeing here so this is the table that's very important that you need to know uh, with regards to lupus nephritis you have six class of lupus nephritis class one is called as minimal methangel class two is called as methangel proliferative class three is called as focal lupus nephritis class four is diffuse lupus nephritis and uh, class 5 is membranous nephropathy or membranous glomerular nephritis and class 6 is advanced sclerosing. How they are going to present? Minimal mesangel, completely asymptomatic. Uh, the patient will not have any problem at all. Even light microscopy will be normal. Uh, class 2 also patient will be asymptomatic or rarely they can have microscopic hematuria alone. Or they can have just microscopic hematuria. But otherwise like no major manifestations. Class 3 and class 4 they are going to present with uh, glomerular nephritis. They will either present with acute glomerular nephritis or they are going to present with rapidly progressing glomerular nephritis. That's what they are going to present. Commonly glomerular nephritis in the sense they will have hematuria, they will present with AK that is increased serum creatinine and they are go also going to have hypertension plus or minus increased blood pressure. This is the characteristic feature of nephritic syndrome, glomerular nephritis. And whenever you talk about glomerular hematuria, patient will have RBC cars. And the most common type of lupus nephritis is going to be class 4 lupus nephritis okay most common type of lupus nephritis is class 4 diffuse lupus nephritis and membranous nephropathy patients typically present with nephrotic syndrome okay they are going to present with nephrotic syndrome and uh, advanced sclerosing patients will present with ESRD that is end stage renal disease so is there any role for immunosuppression remember class 1 and class 2 we are not going to use any immunosuppression no immunosuppression required in fact no treatment required you just observe and class 6 also no role for immunosuppression because already patient is a ESRD, end stage renal disease and you just manage like a just another ESRD patient, no immunosuppression. These three classes, 3, 4 and 5 is the one that requires intense immunosuppression. Okay. So like cyclophosphamide, rituximab and all, you give only for 3, 4 and 5, not for class 1, 2 and 6. Our patient, you can see this patient is having uh, hematuria and this patient is also having proteinuria along with blood cell gas. So I would most likely go for either this patient is having a class 3 or probably a class 4 lupus nephritis. Our patient is having a class 3 or class 4 lupus nephritis but I know class 4 is the most severe form and class 4 is also the most common form. And many of you are commenting, yes, very commonly in light microscopy you see wire loop lesions and of course in immunofluorescence you can see the full loss pattern which is also asked in one of the AIMS exams. Going to another nephrology question, it is based on acid base. Remember, usually you tend to get at least one acid base question in most exams, and usually the question will be easy. Sometimes it can be tough. INACT questions will be tough. Neat PG and FMG questions generally will be easy. You have a male patient present to emergency department. ABG shows pH of 7.2, which means patient is acidotic. Patient is having acidosis. PCO2 is 81 millimeters of mercury, which means PCO2 is increased. Bicarbonate is 40, which means bicarbonate is also increased as a compensation. Which of the following is the most likely diagnosis? So you know that there are two problems, okay. So one is increased bicarbonate and one is another is increased PCO2. But you know clearly that the increased PCO2 is the one that correlates with the pH. Increased bicarbonate should have caused alkalosis, not acidosis, if it is the primary disorder. So here the primary problem is increased carbon dioxide, that is CO2, that is the one that is causing the acidosis. That's the reason for the patient's pH here. That's why this is the primary problem. And what you see here is basically a compensatory problem. So the right answer for this question is going to be option C that is respiratory acidosis. So this is a table that will help you understand. So how will you diagnose the primary problem whether it is metabolic acidosis or alkalosis or respiratory acidosis or alkalosis. So I mean this table might be uh, seemingly confusing but no need to like uh, think about all these things. Just look at what is the pH and see which is correlating with the 
pH. Usually there will be only one thing that's going to correlate with the pH and that is the primary problem. Okay. For example, if the pH is low and if the bicarbonate and carbon dioxide both are low, definitely we know that low bicarbonate is the one that's going to correlate with the pH and that's why it is metabolic osmosis. This must be compensation, right? This must be compensation. Similarly, if the pH is high, it is alkalosis. If bicarbonate and carbon dioxide both are increased, then definitely you need to know that the high bicarbonate is the one that's going to cause alkalosis and the high carbon dioxide must be a compensatory event. And similarly, if the pH is low and if the bicarbonate and PCO2 is increasing, you know it is acidosis, it's an acidotic pH and only high carbon dioxide can correlate with this acidosis, that's why it's respiratory acidosis and this high bicarbonate should be a compensatory event, as simple as that. And if the patient is an alkalotic pH, the pH is high and if the bicarbonate and PCO2 are low, then we know for sure that the low PACO2 is the one that's causing alkyl, I mean the pH rise here and this fall in the bicarbonate must be a compensatory event. So that's why it is a respiratory alkalosis. But remember it's very easy, no need to mug up this table and all, just see which parameter correlates with the pH and that's going to be the primary problem. And there will be a question, I mean there will be a question uh, from the students that in all these conditions I mentioned the arrows are moving in the same direction. So this is the usual norm. But if the arrows are moving in the opposite direction, for example, if bicarbonate is increasing, carbon dioxide is decreasing, or bicarbonate is decreasing, carbon dioxide is increasing, which means if the arrows are moving in the opposite direction, then what will you suggest? It's always almost a mixed disorder. Always keep that in mind. In exam, no need to work up at all. Whenever the arrows are moving in the opposite direction, it is equivalent to mixed problem. That's all. You can just finish off the question and move on. Okay, now moving on to gastroenterology questions. I have like three to four gastroenterology questions. You have a patient... Uh, who is having a history of chronic liver disease presenting with abdominal distension, jaundice and pruritus. Astic fluid analysis revealed a neutrophil count of 650 per cubic millimeter. What is the most likely diagnosis here? Okay, so is it spontaneous bacterial peritonitis or malignant ascites or pantritis or secondary bacterial peritonitis? What is the right answer? The right answer for this question is SBP. That is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. So, so when will you think about spontaneous bacterial peritonitis in exam? First of all, remember your acidic fluid character should not change. Whatever is the background problem, that should be the case. And first you need to know what is the difference between SBP and secondary bacterial peritonitis. Spontaneous bacterial peritonitis means patient is having ascites. Ascites is the primary problem. On top of that, the patient is developing infection. Okay, So that is SBP. SBP means patient is already having ascites. On top of that, is getting infection. So what about secondary bacterial peritonitis? Secondary bacterial peritonitis means patient will develop infection first. On top of that, you will develop ascites. Because of infection, you are developing ascites, which means there is some peritoneal leak. For example, there could be a bowel perforation. On top of that, patient is developing ascites. That is secondary bacterial peritonitis. So spontaneous bacterial peritonitis usually will be diagnosed by two things. One is neutrophil count. If the neutrophil count is more than 250, plus remember patient's acidic fluid culture should be positive. Culture should be positive. So patient should have a neutrophil count of more than 250 and patient's acidic fluid culture should be positive. Okay, then only you can make a diagnosis. But empirical diagnosis can be made just with a neutrophil count of more than 250 for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. But in case, if it's secondary bacterial peritonitis, you have to follow something called as Runyon criteria. So we use something called Runyon criteria where the acidic fluid total protein, TP means total protein, the acidic fluid will be more than 10 grams per deciliter. And second, um, your uh, LDH levels will be increased, it will be more than 240 and third, okay, the glucose levels will be very low, less than 50, okay, 50 milligrams per deciliter. So this is what we call as Runyon criteria, based on this only we are going to make a diagnosis of secondary bacterial peritonitis. And somebody is asking drug of choice for SBP, remember, according to the western textbooks, it is septroxone, okay, septroxone is the first line drug. But in India, we follow ICMR guidelines because in India, the resistance to septoroxone is very, very high. That's why we follow piperazolin tazobactam. So in exam, either of this could be the answer. Either you can follow septoroxone if they are not given piptazo or if they are given piptazo, that will be the best drug because in India, the resistance rates to septoroxone keflosporins are going to be very, very high. So malignant acidosis and pancreatitis will have a different picture. Okay? That's not going to have the similar picture by the way. So this is another very important table because I wanted to discuss the must know tables also in this uh, session. That's why I've given tables after tables. So this table you need to know for sure. So you need to know how to tell uh, what is the uh, 
type of acid is, what is the cause of acid is. Okay, based on that, we use something called SAG ratio, that is serum albumin acid is gradient. If it's more than 1.1, it is equivalent to portal hypertension, that's all. It's equivalent to portal hypertension. If it is less than 1.1, it is not portal hypertension, that's all. This is what the uh, first thing that you need to know. Okay, if it's more than 1.1, it is portal hypertension. If it is less than 1.1, it is not portal hypertension. Number one, that is what you need to know. And uh, next, based on the total protein, acidic fluid total protein, you can classify. If the acidic fluid total protein is less than 2.5, on top of a SAG ratio of more than 1.1, it's called as high SAG low protein acid. This it indicates a sinusoidal disease. That's called sinusoidal obstruction or sinusoidal portal hypertension. The most common reason is cirrhosis. That's the most common reason. In fact, 97% of the times, if the SAG ratio is more than 1.1, the reason is cirrhosis. Only 3% of the times, it will be due to other causes. So second, it could be due to acute hepatitis causing acute liver failure or it could be due to malignancy like hepatocellular cancer, but it's very rare. Cirrhosis is the most important. And if the acidic fluid total protein is more than 2.5, that is called as high protein, high SAG acidus. When it is the case, you think about pre-sinusoidal or post-sinusoidal obstruction. Pre-sinusoidal means the most important are EHPO, that is extra hepatic portal vein obstruction that occurs in the childhood phase and NCPF that occurs in young adults. NCPF stands for non cirrhotic portal fibrosis. Post-sinusoidal obstruction means the most important is Bertschieri syndrome. Generally, we are talking about an acute Bertschieri syndrome. Remember, when you talk about chronic Bertschieri syndrome, chronic Bertschieri syndrome will mimic a cirrhosis only. So, when you talk about chronic Bertschieri, it is equal to cirrhosis. Acute Bertschieri only will have this picture. And we have sinusoidal obstruction syndrome and right heart failure. Right heart failure means cardiac cirrhosis. When the patient is having chronic cardiac problem, that itself can cause portal hypertension. So, sinusoidal obstruction syndrome, you can suspect in post bone marrow transplant. After hematopoietic stem cell transplant or after BMT, SOS is a very, very common complication. So, there is a drug called defibrotide that we use for treatment also, but that's not important. But nevertheless, uh, this is a very, very important point that you have to know. So, all are very, very important and golden points for exam. If the SAG ratio is less than 1, 1.1, 1 .1, I told you, it's a low SAG acid, it's not portal hypertension. If it's a low SAG acid, think about peritoneal carcinomatosis. That is dissemination of some cancer into the peritoneum. You are thinking about biliary leak or nephrotic syndrome, pantreatis, tuberculosis, or even some textbooks mention hypothyroidism also. So anything that is not related to portal hypertension will fall under low SAG acidis only. That's why I told you, here we are dealing with cirrhosis, isn't it? So when they talked about chronic levitis and cirrhosis, obviously it's not malignant acidis or pantreatis. They are talking about a high SAG and a low protein acidis. Okay, that's what is going to uh, be seen in the pa in patients with cirrhosis and portal hypertension. And remember, on top of this, if you develop infection, okay, it's equivalent to SBP, that is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Okay, which means the baseline acidic fluid character will not change. On top of that, patient is developing infection. So still the patient's SAG ratio will be more than 1.1 and acidic fluid total protein will be less than 2.5. But only the neutrophil count will be increased. Then you diagnose SBP. That is spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. If it's secondary bacterial peritonitis, you are going to have a SAG of less than 1.1 pattern. If it's a secondary bacterial peritonitis, it's a low SAG acidis. Okay, it's a different. That's why in secondary bacterial peritonitis, your total protein will be more than 10. I told you in the Runyon criteria. So secondary bacterial peritonitis is also an example of low SAG acidis only. So, even though this is a little confusing table, but it's very important for your exam. This table is straight from Harrison. And coming to the next question. A patient with history of chronic levitis presents with abdominal distension, jaundice and pruritus. Acidic fluid analysis reveals a PM1 count of 650. I think the same question, right? So, I think it's only repeating. So, I'm just going to push this question again. Again, answer is going to be SBP. We have discussed it already. Okay. A chronic alcoholic male patient presented with abdominal distension and reduced urine output and fetal edema, serum creatinine is 1.6, what is the next line of management in this patient? Okay, so basically whenever the patient is presenting with cirrhosis and high creatinine, the first diagnosis that you make is not HRS because one of the common mistakes that is done by a intern or a newly joined resident is to make a diagnosis of hepatorenal syndrome. Whenever they see a patient with cirrhosis and renal failure, they think it's HRS. No, it's not HRS. There are plenty of other causes that can cause rise the serum creatinine. Like patient can be too much diurist. Because of too much of diuresis, patients can have hypolemia and that can raise the creatinine, pre-renal AKA. And patients can be receiving some nephrotoxic drugs like vancomycin or gentamicin, that can cause AKA. Sepsis can cause AKA. 
okay there are plenty of things that can cause ak it's not just hrs so basically before diagnosing hrs you need to rule out all the other causes which means hrs is a diagnosis of exclusion so first you need to stop all the diuretics you need to stop all the nephrotoxic drugs you need to give volume replacement in cirrhosis and ascites patients you cannot give fluids because they are already volume moderate so the best replacement uh, therapy is going to be with albumin we are going to use 20 percent albumin for cirrhosis patients we cannot use normal saline or other fluids because already the patient is volume moderate so this patient likely assuming the question uh, tells you that the patient is likely suffering from hepatorenal syndrome so the treatment of choice for hepatorenal syndrome is going to be octreotide plus albumin or alternatively you can use terlipresin plus albumin also alternative therapy will be terlipresin plus albumin as well methylprednisolone will be used in patients probably with uh, alcoholic hepatitis sometimes if the discrimination factor is more than 32 or you can use it in the setting of autoimmune hepatitis acute severe autoimmune hepatitis you can use methylprednisolone but not in patients with uh, hrs heparin I don't think so. Like, who is going to use uh, anticoagulant in a patient with uh, liver failure? I'm not going to use. Torsamide is not a good choice because you are already thinking about HRS. And first, you have to stop all the diuretics. Then only you can make a diagnosis of HRS. Why you want to give diuretic like torsamide? So that's also wrong. So the right answer for this question is going to be octreotide plus albumin or it's going to be terlipresin with albumin. Terlipresin is an alternative to octreotide. But in India, in most uh, tertiary care centers, they commonly use terlipresin rather than octreotide. And remember, if it doesn't work, if the patient is not responding, then you have to proceed with tips. That is transjugular intrahepatic uh, portosystemic shunt. Or alternatively, you can use orthotopic liver transplantation also. So OLT is considered to be the best treatment for any cirrhosis related complication. So OLT, that is orthotopic liver transplantation. But initially, you can manage with tips. Okay, unless until you don't have any major contraindication for tips. Remember, the most important major contraindication for tips is going to be hepatic encephalopathy. If the patient is having moderate to severe hepatic encephalopathy or grade 3 4 hepatic encephalopathy, TIPS is contraindicated because TIPS itself can cause shunt related encephalopathy. So, if the patient is also having hepatic encephalopathy and it's grade 3 4, the best treatment will be liver transplant only, nothing more than that. Okay, so coming to the next question laboratory investigation of a patient being evaluated for jaundice show elevated bilirubin and ALP levels. Levels of the remaining liver enzymes are normal. What is the likely diagnosis? Is it obstructive jaundice or is it hemolytic jaundice or is it hepatic jaundice or is it prehepatic jaundice? So this is straightforward giveaway. Patient is having elevated alkaline phosphorase levels and elevated bilirubin, but patient is having um, uh, normal AST and ALT. So straight away, the answer is going to be obstructive jaundice. There is nothing more than that that you need to know in this question. Hemolytic jaundice patients will be having elevated bilirubin, predominantly unconjugated fraction plus or minus there will be a slight increase in AST slight increase in AST may be seen sometimes but ALT will be normal and alkaline phosphorase levels also will be relatively normal and in hepatic jaundice definitely ALT levels will be elevated that's very very important in pre-hepatic jaundice that's again like it's equal to hemolytic jaundice only so that's only a dummy choice I would feel so let me tell you another table for you okay so this is a very very important table so I'm going to show. Just hold on. Yeah, this is a very very important table. So how will you categorize between different types of jaundice, hepatocellular jaundice uh, versus viral hepatitis, and NASH versus alcoholic hepatitis? What is the pattern that you're going to see? If it's a hepatocellular jaundice, the most important picture is your ALT and AST levels will be seriously elevated and ALP levels uh, may be elevated okay so I'll write just plus or minus and bilirubin may or may not be elevated it depends so in most cases bilirubin also will be elevated but predominantly it will be a direct bilirubin it will not be an indirect bilirubin it's a conjugated not unconjugated if it's going to be viral hepatitis or NASH they are going to again show the same pattern ALT will be elevated AST also will be elevated but often ALT elevation will be more compared to that of the ALT elevation AST elevation that is why there is a saying that AST ALT ratio will be less than 1 in the setting of viral hepatitis. And often, if it's an acute viral hepatitis, if it's an acute viral hepatitis, AST ALT levels will be in the thousands. Generally, AST ALT will be in the thousands. If it's NASH, non alcoholic steroid hepatitis, AST ALT levels will be just in the hundreds. I mean, maybe in the 50s or hundreds. 
just elevated like 60, 50. So that's what I'm saying. Normal AST and ALT are going to be less than 40. We all know that. And the ALP levels, plus or minus again elevated because it's an hepatocellular problem. Bilirubin, only in late stages it will elevate. Or in only in significant hepatitis it will elevate. Otherwise it will be normal. So mostly it will be direct. In alcoholic hepatitis also, you will have ALT elevation and you will have AST elevation. There is no doubt about that. But remember, your AST elevation will be more usually in alcoholic hepatitis compared to ALT and that's why in alcoholic hepatitis the AST ALT ratio will be more than 2 generally. This is what we refer to as something called as d retis ratio. I'll repeat that's called as d retis ratio. Another important point that you need to know is in alcoholic hepatitis even though AST levels are more than ALT but often AST levels will not exceed 400 or 500. AST levels will be less than 400 only. And alkaline phosphates again may or may not be elevated and bilirubin may or may not be elevated. And if it's elevated, it will be predominantly a direct fraction. What about ischemic apparatus? In ischemic apparatus, AST will be elevated, ALT also will be elevated significantly. In fact, the maximum elevation, if you ask me, it's going to be in ischemic apparatus only. But once the ischemia is resolved, there will be a very quick resolution, extremely quick resolution of the enzymes. And ALP levels uh, will be usually elevated in patients with ischemic apparatus and bilirubin levels also will be definitely elevated, predominantly it will be direct. What happens in Wilson? In acute Wilson disease, ALT, AST will be elevated and uh, alkaline phosphatase levels will be actually decrease. That's the most important point. There are very few conditions where alkaline phosphatase levels will be low. One of the examples is Wilson disease. Other examples are severe hypothyroidism, zinc deficiency or congenital problems. But Wilson is a very important condition where alkaline phosphatase levels can be actually low. And uh, bilirubin levels may or may not be elevated. So it can be normal or it can be elevated but predominantly it will be a direct fraction and there is a very important ratio that you need to know in acute Wilson disease. Acute fulminant Wilson disease, alkaline phosphatase by total bilirubin ratio will be generally less than 4. That suggests that ALP levels are very very low compared to bilirubin. So that's why ALP by total bilirubin ratio of less than 4 indicates Wilson, acute fulminant Wilson disease. Sometimes in cholestatic pattern, if it's an obstructive jaundice, AST may be elevated, ALT may be elevated, but that's not important. But the most important pointer here is alkaline phosphatase and GGT elevation and bilirubin will be surely elevated and most often than not, it will be a direct fraction. If it's an infiltrative pattern like sarcoidosis or some cancer, usually AST, ALT levels will be relatively normal or mildly elevated. Okay, again alkaline phosphatase elevation is very very important. So which means if there is a patient with hepatic metastasis or hepatocellular cancer, the first thing is ALP elevation only. If there is some solid organ, I mean some solid lesion in the liver, that will usually cause ALP elevation first and bilirubin may or may not be elevated. That's why in HCC, bilirubin elevation occurs only very late, not early. So some non-hepatic patterns. In skeletal muscle injury, what are you going to see? You can see AST elevation but ALT will be normal. Remember, in most of the non-hepatic causes, ALT levels will be normal because ALT is specific for liver injury. So, AST only will be elevated. Okay. In bone disease, AST also will be normal. In hemolysis also, AST will be relatively normal or only mild elevation can be seen, nothing more than that. ALP levels will be normal here. ALP levels will be normal here. But in bone disease, ALP levels will be elevated. Okay. But the most important pointer here is GGT levels will be normal. So sometimes you may confuse this elevated ALP with obstructive jaundice, but you can further confirm that it is not obstruction with GGT. If it's an obstructive jaundice, GGT also will be elevated, but here GGT will be normal only. And what about bilirubin? Bilirubin will be normal, bilirubin normal, but bilirubin will be increased, but predominantly it will be indirect bilirubin, that is unconjugated bilirubin. Okay? So this is a very, very important table. I think this one table will tell you how to approach LFTs. So this is a very, very important pattern of LFT that you need to know for exams. I think you can get it right. So this becomes so simple now. So just remember this table and you don't need anything more than this. Okay. Now going to the next question. So you have a patient presenting to you with uh, fever and jaundice and malaise. Uh, with what is the most likely diagnosis based on the serology reports given below. So patient is having anti-HBC, IgM, this is not IM, this is IgM, IgM positivity, HbSAG is also positive and anti-HbS is negative and anti-HCV antibodies are also negative. So which means what is the likely diagnosis here? So it's a straightforward. So patient is HbSAG positive means patient is having infection 
infection is there and IgM positivity means it's an acute infection. IgM is acute. So the right answer is acute hepatitis B. If it's acute hepatitis C, patient will be having either anti-HCV positivity or HCV RNA positivity. Okay, HCV RNA positivity. If it's acute hepatitis C and it's not acute hepatitis C. It's chronic hepatitis B, uh, patient will be having anti-HBC IgG positivity. Anti-HBC IgG will be positive, not IgM. IgG will be positive. So that's not the right answer. In chronic hepatitis C, again, anti-HCV will be positive and HCV RNA will be positive. Okay, if it's a chronic HCV. So it's not chronic HCV either. Again, let me talk about another important table. I think like there will be no exam without uh, your... Uh, I mean, Neeraj Mishra is telling that such easy questions will come in neat UG and not in neat PG. Actually, these are neat PG questions only. If you have any doubt, you can go and watch for it. And remember, still like, uh, why students are making mistakes then? There are a lot of students who don't get the present. That is because they make silly mistakes. It's not because like they don't know the answer. Many students know the answer. Many students have prepared well. But the problem is many students make silly mistakes. They think that the questions are complex. But majority of the questions in neat PG, trust me, are not complex basically. They are actually quite simple. And thinking they are complex, they make mistakes in the exam. And that is the reason why some students miss the bus. Okay. So what about uh, this table? This is a very important table, isn't it? So I am going to tell you the serological pattern and you are going to tell the diagnosis. HBSIG positive, anti-HBS negative, which means there is no immunity. Anti-HBC IgM positive, HBEAG positive, anti-HB anti is negative, HBV DNA is positive. It indicates a acute HBV infection. So all negative, okay, and HBSAG negative but IgM alone positive, whenever you see this picture, HBSAG negative, IgM alone is positive, that indicates a window period, okay, that indicates window period. So in exam, HBSAG negative and HBC IgM positive, it is equal to window period, others are variable. And uh, HBSAG negative, anti-HBS positive, anti-HBC IgG is positive. HB EAG is negative, anti HB may be positive or negative, that's variable, HBV DNA negative. So whenever HBSAG is negative, IgG is positive, and anti HBS is also positive means what does it mean? That indicates that the patient is having a resolved infection. Because here the patient is not in having active infection because surface antigen is negative. But anti HBS positive means the patient has developed immunity against HBV, and if anti HBC IgG is positive, means that indicates a past infection somewhere in the past. So that's a resolved infection. So if HBSAG negative, anti HBS positive, all others are negative, that indicates that the patient is vaccinated. It indicates a vaccinated status. And if HBSAG is positive, okay, anti HBS negative, and HBC IgG is positive, means it's chronic HBV infection but it is EAG positive with high infectivity EAG positive okay in acute it doesn't matter man EAG doesn't matter E antigen doesn't matter only in chronic infections E antigen matters this is high infectivity chronic HBV with high infectivity E antigen positive HBV DNA of course will be positive again if HBSAG is positive um, IgG is positive means again it indicates a chronic infection and anti-HBS is negative which means patient has not developed immunity against the infection. It's a chronic infection only but E antigen is negative which means it's low infectivity. That's it. It is low infectivity, E antigen negative. Anti-HB usually will be positive here if E antigen is negative and HBV DNA may be positive or negative which, which means HBV DNA can be seriously suppressed here because the patient is having a good immunity against the virus but not a complete immunity because anti-HBS is the protective antibody. That is negative here. And anti-HB is protecting the patient for a temporary period here. That's all. So these are the six important serological tables that you need to know. But in a nutshell, I would say surface antigen is a marker of infection. Whenever surface antigen is positive, it indicates infection. It's a marker of infection. And E antigen is a marker of infectivity. Okay. E antigen is a marker of infectivity. And anti-HBS is a marker of immunity. Whenever anti-HBS is there, it indicates immunity against infection. It's a marker of infectivity. It's anti-HBS. And anti-HBC, either IgM or IgG, doesn't matter. It's a marker of exposure. Whenever anti-HBC is positive, some form, IgM or IgG is there, it indicates you are exposed to hepatitis B already. That's a marker of exposure. And HBV DNA is a marker of replication. In fact, this is the best marker of replication. Okay, in fact, HBV DNA is the one that correlates with all the 
HB related complications like cirrhosis and hepatic cellular cancer. Higher the DNA, higher the risk of complications. It's a mark of replication. So these are the five things that you need to know for sure. Okay, now coming to some important infectious diseases questions. A patient was being diagnosed with retropositive and started on highly active antiretroviral therapy. Which of the following can be used to monitor the treatment efficacy? The CD4 uh, T cell count or viral load or P24 antigen or viral serotype. So remember previously like maybe a decade ago we used to monitor with viral load and CD4 count but currently we monitor only with viral load. Only viral load is enough. Nothing more than that is enough. So generally we do viral load at 6 months and 12 months. Okay, at 6 months and 12 months. This is the current NACO guidelines. NACO recommendations say once you start with therapy, you have to repeat the viral load at 6 months and 12 months. And uh, there should be at least 3 log reduction. 3 log reduction in the viral load. 3 log reduction means 1000 fold reduction in the viral load. Or viral load should be undetectable by 6 months and 12 months. So that is what we call as a successful treatment. Otherwise, it's called as virological failure. And currently preferred regime, if they ask you about preferred regime, it is TLD regime. So what is TLD regime? It is stenophovir, lamivudin and dolutegravir. dolutegravir. So this is the TLD regime. Okay, stenophovir, lamivudin and dolutegravir or you can use emtricetabin also as an alternative to lamivudin. And this is not a table basically but it's a very very important uh, uh, algorithm that is given in the NACO guidelines only. So Whenever you start therapy, you need to conduct viral load at a scheduled duration. Scheduled duration, I told you, it's usually around 6 months and 12 months. So what you are doing, you are doing only viral load. Remember, NACO guidelines doesn't suggest to do a CD4 count. Because doing CD4 count doesn't have any meaning uh, as of now. Because it's only going to increase the cost. Just do a viral load, that's enough. If the viral load, okay, is going to be less than 1000 copies. Okay, if it's less than 1000 copies, which means there is more than more than 3 log reduction or there is a good response, you are going to continue the same ART, which means it's a successful treatment. If the viral load is more than 1000 or if the decline is less than 3 log reduction, then you have to definitely find out uh, uh, what is the reason for that and one of the reasons could be non-adherence to therapy. So you have to ensure adherence, that's the next step because patient may not be taking the drugs adequately. So, if you confirm that the patient has taken the drugs for at least 95% of the days, in the last 3 months, if the patient has taken drugs for at least 95% of the days, which means that is a good adherence to therapy, and then in that situation, conduct a viral load test again after ensuring adherence. The viral load is less than 1000, which means it's a simple case of non adherence, just continue the same therapy. If the viral load is more than 1000, you have to refer to specialist. Okay, you have to refer to specialist in that situation. Uh, there we will do some mutation testing on, we have to find out is there any drug resistance or not and then we can uh, find out the alternative regime for this patient. And coming to the next uh, question. So you have a 68 year old man who presents with cough and yellow sputum, ascultation revealed bronchial breath sounds, is hemodynamically stable and not confused. On examination his respiratory rate is 20 per minute, blood pressure is 110 bar 70 millimeters of mercury. Lab test shows a urea level of 44 milligrams per deciliter. What is the next best step in the management of this patient? So basically, they are asking about curve 65 based management. Curve 65 is so important for exams, isn't it? You know, C stands for confusion that carries one point. U stands for urea. So typically, we use blood urea nitrogen. Uh, according to Western standards, it is more than 7 millimoles per liter. But if you convert that millimoles to Indian standard, that is milligrams per deciliter, it is burned more than. 20 milligrams per deciliter or alternatively you can say urea more than 40 because two times the burn will give you the urea urea more than 40 r stands for respiratory rate if respiratory rate is more than 30 and b stands for blood pressure bp if there is low bp sbp less than 90 or dbp less than 60 and fourth finally is going to be age age more than 65 all of them are going to carry one one point so we know that if the score is 0 or 1 you have to consider outpatient management. If the score is 2, you can consider a short inpatient management. If 3 and above, you have to go for a definite inpatient management. Definite inpatient management and patient may require ICU admission also. But remember, uh, ICU admission will not be predicted by the CURB 65 score. We have separate scores for predicting ICU admission with commute acquired pneumonia. And uh, another important thing that you need to know is that CURB 65 score is applicable only for commute acquired pneumonia. Okay. It is not applicable for hospital acquired pneumonia or it is not applicable for ventilator acquired pneumonia. We have separate scoring systems for that. It is only for CAP. 
so here the patient score let us assume what is the patient score i think the patient score is 2 so patient is not confused but age is more than 63 so that carries one point and urea is 44 that also carries one point other things are fine so score is 2 so i'm going to consider admission in a non-icu setting so the right answer for this question is option b so look at the treatment for cap here so again another very important table for your exams so if it's outpatient based management you can use either a macrolide drug like azithromycin or you can use doxycycline okay remember in case even if it's a outpatient based treatment if the patient if the patient has exposed to antibiotics in the last 90 days exposed to antibiotics in the last 90 days or if the patient is having comorbid conditions like cancer liver failure, renal failure, heart failure, lung disease, any comorbid condition, okay. In this situation, you cannot use this therapy. Rather, we have to use a beta-lactam drug like amoxicillin clavulanic acid or um, third generation cephalosporin like uh, cefixim or cefpodoxin. Along with it, you need to use a azithromycin or doxycycline. Which means, even as an outpatient therapy, if you see this, you have to add beta lactams. Okay, that's very, very important. Azithromycin and doxy alone is not, or doxy alone is not going to be enough. An alternative therapy will be respiratory fluoroquinolones. When you talk about respiratory fluoroquinolones, only two drugs are there. One is levoflox, second is moxiflox. These have atypical cover. That's why they are called as respiratory fluoroquinolones. Levoflox and moxiflox. This is an alternative treatment. If you are deciding on inpatient treatment, same. So, same therapy will be applicable. That's all. Whatever I told you here, same thing you are going to use either a respiratory fluoroquinolone but in India we avoid because in India almost always there is a possibility of tuberculosis and fluoroquinolones being a very important alternative second line therapy for tuberculosis we don't use fluoroquinolones rather we stick on to this combination that is uh, beta lactams plus azithromycin or doxycycline and coming to the third one third one is ICU stay if the patient is in ICU then there is no role for any alternative treatment definitely you have to use beta lactams there is no doubt about that plus you have to use along with that fluoroquinolone or azithromycin this fluoroquinolone will be a respiratory fluoroquinolone like leofloxacin or moxifloxacin and an add-on treat i mean alternative to that will be a macro like azithromycin or even clarithromycin this is a standard therapy for community acquired pneumonia very very commonly asked in exams and what is the duration of treatment this is an area that is not touched in your exams i believe that this may be asked in exams for community acquired pneumonia minimum duration of treatment is five days Plus, you can extend the treatment till the patient becomes hemodynamically stable and the patient is afebrile at least for a duration of 48 hours. And in case if the patient is having a hospital acquired pneumonia or a ventilator acid pneumonia, the minimum duration of therapy is 8 days. And many people ask me the use of procalcitonin in the treatment of pneumonia. Remember, procalcitonin is never used for starting the therapy. Procalcitonin is only used to taper the therapy. If the procalcitonin levels are decreasing and if it is going below the uh, reference range, then probably you can de-escalate the therapy and you can taper and stop the therapy. For that only use procalcitonin. Don't use procalcitonin to start antibiotic treatment. Okay. So minimum duration of CAP therapy is 5 days and minimum duration of HAP and VAP therapy is 8 days. In CAP, minimum 5 days plus the patient has to become stable and they should become afebrile for at least 48 hours. And I told you the most important treatment of common acquired pneumonia already. And do you know the newer tetracycline? Newer tetracycline that is approved for patients who are inpatients, not for ICU patients. Newer tetracycline. So what is the newer tetracycline that's approved? Which can be used as a single drug. Usually doxy will not be used as a single drug. But this newer tetracycline can be used as a single drug. You know what is the drug that's called as omodacycline? Omodacycline, this is a newer tetracycline that can be used as a single drug. Okay. So usually doxy will never be used as a single therapy unless and until it's outpatient therapy without any risk factors. For IP, we never use doxy as a single therapy, but omodacycline can be used as a single therapy. That's a very important point. And next, you're talking about ICU patients. ICU patients never give doxy, okay? ICU never doxy. Never ever give doxy in ICU patients. It's not indicated. And another thing they may ask is, if they have beta-lactam allergy, pencil allergy, so what is the alternative that you can use? Even this is a question in exam, that is astronomy. Astronum. Astronum is an alternative drug in case if the patient is allergic to penicillin, allergic to beta lactams. So, but that's usually for ICU patients. It's not required, typically required for outpatient and inpatient therapy. Okay, why? Because astronum has 0% cross sensitivity. If the patient is having penicillin allergy, 
that is 1% risk of cross sensitivity to carbapenems and around 2 to 3% cross sensitivity risk to cephalosporins but 0% cross reaction to astyonum that's why we prefer astyonum and again why only for icu patients it's because in uh, icu patients beta lactams are a must but in op and ip therapy beta lactams are not a must you can use fluoroquinolones as an alternative so you have always have an alternative for but icu patients beta lactam is a must that's why for icu patients only astyonum has to be known okay because you have to use beta lactams and in case if the pain is having pencil energy alternative choice is going to be uh, astyonum why doxy can't be given so remember if the patient is in icu you think uh, the patient will have sepsis or patient will not have sepsis simple question patient will be having sepsis or patient will not be having sepsis the patient is in icu of course the patient will be septic right so and if you look at the pharmacokinetics of doxycycline doxycycline is a drug that's not going to have a significant plasma concentration it is a drug with very high volume of distribution so the uh, therapeutic concentration of doxycycline uh, to say in the blood is going to be very very low so that's why we don't uh, use doxycycline but doxycycline has an excellent tissue distribution okay that's why for icu patients generally we don't use tetracyclines or any septic patient we don't use tetracyclines we avoid tetracyclines because they have a good tissue distribution but they don't have a good um, mic in the drug that's uh, mic in the blood that's why and i think we have we are coming to the end actually we have only two more questions okay so the csf specimen of a patient shown below along with microscopy the report shows mononuclear cytosis elevated proteins and low sugars which of the following is the likely etiology and they have given this image also and this is straightforward giveaway such an easy question you can see the image straightforward it shows the cobweb coagulum because of high protein and this is typically described in patients with tuberculosis so the right answer for this question is tuberculosis meningitis if it's going to be acute bacterial meningitis obviously your neutrophils will be high not lymphocytes so here mononuclear no? so in tbm your lymphocytes will be high and proteins will be high but in abm neutrophils will be high and proteins will be high and usually bacterial cultures will be positive some bacterial culture sensitivity will be positive and gram stain sometimes can be positive and also another important point that many people miss is the csf lactate levels will be elevated okay csf lactate levels will be elevated. even this is a very important pointer towards acute bacterial meningitis and in aseptic meningitis the glucose levels will be normal so very common it will be due to some virus so virus doesn't metabolize glucose so it's going to be normal in fungal meningitis in cryptococcosis uh, usually it will be lymphocytosis predominantly and there will be elevated proteins okay and uh, usually patient will have a history of hiv aids with a low cd4 count like less than 100 or less than 50 on top of that patient will have a subacute presentation like altered mental status and obtundation and along with that uh, you know that india ink stain okay this is a very common question in exam india ink stain will be showing that uh, uh, organisms because they don't stain the capsule it's a negative stain so i, I should not say india ink stain will be positive india ink stain will show the organism i think that's an appropriate word because it's a negative stain but the amount of patients show the india ink positivity is very very low like only 10 to 20 percent will have india ink positivity but the best test is actually crag you can do serum crag or you can do a csf crag csf crag crag is cryptococcal antigen Okay, cryptococcus primary site of infection is the lung. In case if you see the cryptococcal antigen in the serum or in the CSF specifically, it indicates dissemination. So that's why this is the best test. India in case an outdated test. But obviously, you know, like for undergraduate level, it's important. But you need to know the best test is only crag. Yes, in cryptococcus, CSF opening pressure will be extremely high. That's correct. Yeah, glucose also will be low. Correct. Glucose will be low in all these conditions. Even acute bacterial meningitis, glucose will be low. And TB meningitis also, glucose will be low. The only area where glucose will be normal is aseptic meningitis. And everyone knows like uh, this table, isn't it? So that's a very important table. So in bacterial meningitis, in, in almost all the conditions, opening pressure may be higher. But in viral meningitis alone, opening pressure can be slightly normal. Sometimes normal. Cell type will be neutrophils in bacterial meningitis, lymphocytes in fungal TB and viral meningitis and protein levels will be elevated in almost 
all the cases but it can be slightly normal in the setting of viral meningitis glucose levels will be low and glucose will be normal in the setting of viral meningitis that's all so this is the very important point to diagnose viral meningitis in exam and uh, what is the most important point for uh, fungal and tb fungal and tb the lymphocytes with low sugar okay that's going to be the giveaway and in bacterial meningitis neutrophils and low glucose that will be the giveaway okay that's the most important point so high neutrophils low glucose think about bacterial maybe they can have high csf lactate high lymphocytes low sugar think about fungal or tb i told you in fungal meningitis crag will be positive or india ink will be positive in tb meningitis your cb not will be positive cb not will be positive and csf ada will be elevated ada will be more than 40 40 usually ada will be elevated so that tells you it's tb usually in viral meningitis the straightforward giveaway in exam will be a normal glucose that's going to tell it's a viral meningitis that's it somebody is asking the drug of choice for uh, cryptococcal meningitis it's actually flu cytosine plus amphotericin b flu cytosine plus amphotericin b amphotericin b plus flu cytosine that's the treatment for cryptococcal meningitis of course if the patient is hiv uh, positive then you have to use uh, antiretroviral therapy as well and i think this is the final question my god okay finally we reach the end so you have uh, what is the definition of mdr tuberculosis mdr tb shows resistance to which are the following drugs so right now we don't use the term mdr xdr i don't know why this question is being asked in the first place so remember mdr means you are going to have hnr resistance that is mdr xdr means patient will have hnr resistance plus there will be at least one fluoroquinolone resistance at least one fluoroquinolone resistance and at least one second line injectable drug resistance second line injectable drug means we are talking about uh, the aminoglycosides stomach acid carnamycin capriomycin not streptomycin streptomycin is the first line injectable second line injectable means we are talking about drugs apart from streptomycin that is amic acid carnamycin and capriomycin so remember this classification of mdr and xdr is not at all important now in the latest uh, ntp guidelines ntp stands for national tuberculosis elimination program right in that there is no point in mdr and xdr classification all we need to know is whether it's drug sensitive tb or whether it is drug resistant tb that's all nothing more than that okay so we use the term drug sensitive tb or drug resistant tb that's all there's no point in classifying into mdr and xdr anymore so right answer for this question is going to be option c that is isonizer and rifampicin because they are talking about mdr definition not xdr definition so obviously uh isonizer rifampicin fluoroquinolone and uh, carnamycin will be an xdr tb so this is the table and you can go through it later on because it's a very busy table i've tried to compress all the information in this one table so where you can see like uh, what is the current ntp recommendations for treating drug resistant tuberculosis so remember for drug sensitive tuberculosis you know what is the treatment you're going to use uh, commonly like the 2 hrz plus 4 hre that's the com that the usual duration of treatment is six months that for drug sensitive tb but for drug resistant TB, it's different. Currently, there is no point in classifying into MDR, XDR, as I told you already. You have to know the grouping of drugs. Number one, I'm not going to discuss now. Maybe in a later session, I'll discuss. And then you need to know what assays show what, what uh, assays uh, can tell you what resistance is there. If you're doing CB not, you can pick up rifampicin resistance. If you're doing line probe assays, you can pick up uh, first line drug resistance, especially HNR resistance. And you can pick up second line drug resistance also, like fluoroquinolones and second line injectables. And the gold standard for resistance assays is going to be your drug sensitivity testing. That's culture media through ALC. That is automated liquid culture. So automated liquid culture can pick up almost any resistance whatsoever. Currently, we use the Bactec MG960 system. So based on that, we have short MDR regime and longer MDR regime. So currently, government of India recommends shorter MDR regime where the total duration of treatment is only like uh, 9 to 11 months. 9 to 11 months is the total duration of therapy initial 4 to 6 months will be intensive phase like where bedaclin has to be given for 6 months for sure and other drugs as mentioned should be given and another 5 months you can give the remaining drugs leofloxacin clofazimin z means pyrazimin e means ethambutol okay but remember you have to carefully look at the exclusion criteria in case if any of this exclusion criteria is uh, given then you have to go to longer mdr regime only Okay, you cannot give shorter MDR, MDR regime. If any exclusion criteria is positive, 
you have to go for longer MDR. You cannot give short MDR region. So what are the exclusion criteria? This could be your exam question. One is flow equivalent resistance or if there is isoniazid resistance to both genes like INHA gene as well as CAT G gene. Second, children less than 5 years of age, pregnant and lactating women, shorter MDR, MDR has not been validated here. If the patient is having severe pulmonary tuberculosis with respiratory failure or severe extra pulmonary tuberculosis like miliary TB, you can't use. Or if the patient is already exposed to uh, the shorter MDR drugs for more than one month plus if your sensitivity reports are not yet available, switch on to longer MDR regime till the sensitivity reports are available. Or if the patient is not tolerating the drugs in the shorter MDR, you cannot use it. You have to go for longer MDR regime. So this is the exclusion criteria. If any of this thing is there, you have to go move to longer MDR regime only. You cannot use shorter MDR regime. Shorter MDR means there should be no exclusion criteria. Okay. And uh, in that case, you can opt for a 9 to 11 month short MDR regime and minimum bedaculin duration is 6 months and this could be an exam question. Okay. And uh, longer MDR regime also will include bedaculin again minimum for duration of 6 months. But remember the most important point is there is no intensive phase and there is no continuation phase. In short MDR regime, you did have an initial intensive phase and then a continuation phase. But in, as per the current recommendations, in longer MDR regime, there is no intensive phase, there is no continuation phase. These drugs should be given for 18 to 20 months, bedaculin minimum for 6 months, that's it. No intensive phase, no continuation phase. Currently, Government of India recommends a full oral regime. Previously, we have been using injectable drugs for drug resistant TB. Currently, we don't use injectable drugs, it's only oral drugs. Just go for full oral regime. Is it short MDR or longer MDR? Just go for oral. All are oral drugs because to increase the compliance of therapy so this is a maximum duration that's not required and pregnancy finally so how will you treat a drug resistant tb in pregnancy if it's a drug sensitive tb and pregnancy same treatment okay same treatment you can use what is the same treatment that is 4 hrzt sorry 2 hrzt plus 4 hre 2 hrzt plus 4 hre okay so that's the same treatment that you are going to use for drug sensitive tb in case if the patient is pregnant and having a drug resistant TB, then the guidelines are different. If the patient is within 20 weeks of gestation, okay, you have to consider MTP. I mean, if the patient is willing for MTP, actually you have to suggest MTP. If the patient is less than 20 weeks and having a drug resistant TB, you have to suggest medical termination of pregnancy. After doing MTP, you can go for shorter MTR. Okay, you can give shorter MTR. Because I told you pregnancy and lactating mothers are basically coming under exclusion criteria for short MDR. So you cannot use short MDR unless and until you do MTP. If the patient is not willing for MTP, less than 20 weeks plus not willing for MTP or if the patient is already beyond 20 weeks, then you have to switch to longer MDR only. Remember pregnancy is a contraindication, actually currently not contraindication, exclusion criteria for short MDR therapy. In this case, you have to go for longer MDR. I will repeat again, less than 20 weeks. MTP is the best option. If the patient is willing for MTP, do MTP and go for short MDR. If the patient is unwilling for MTP plus less than 20 weeks, longer MDR regime. Or if the patient is already more than 20 weeks of gestation, uh, it's better to go for longer MDR regime. There is no role for shorter MDR in this situation. Because patient anyway, after 20 weeks, we won't usually do MTP. We'll wait. If you don't do MTP, uh, they will be excluded from shorter MDR regime. So this is the overall treatment. I believe like the drug resistant TB is more important than the drug sensitive TB. And as I told you currently, there are two, three things that you need to know. One, there is nothing like MDR, XDR that's been removed. And second, even in even for drug resistant TB, Government of India recommends bedaculin based therapy. That is a full oral regimen. So injectables are not preferred nowadays. Whatever may be the type of MDR treatment, short MDR or longer MDR treatment. And apart from that, bedaculin, one of the most important side effects is going to be long QT. So that could be an exam question. If you talk about bedaculin, think about long QT in exam. QTC more than 0.5, it's better to avoid bedaculin. You cannot use bedaculin in that situation. QTC more than 0.5 seconds or 500 milliseconds. Okay, I think we have come to a close finally. I've discussed as many as important topics as possible in this two hour or maybe two and a half hour session. And thank you very much for all of you for staying patient all this while. And anyways, I will try and close this session off and I'll meet you in another session in Cerebellum Academy. Again, if you like this uh, video please subscribe to our channel okay and uh, let us meet in another session in another productive session pdf definitely i'll give you but i don't know whether i'll be able to give annotated pdf or not but pdf definitely i will post in the group 
okay you can uh, come to dr dilip samuel group or maybe i'll uh, post in uh, zainabora madam's group also so you can download the pdf